This is Cowboy Marrying the Lady. Coming Home to North Dakota, Western Sweet Romance, Book 12. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by J. Dice. Chapter 1. Relation that is covenant-based, lifetime commitment, and realization that love is a decision, not a feeling. Luann, Ohio The SUV spun. Ashley Christensen jerked the wheel to the right to try to correct the skid on the icy roads, but the snow was coming down too thickly, and she couldn't see. In a panic, she pressed the brake way too hard. Growing up in the cities, she knew not to brake while skating on ice. But head knowledge didn't always translate into proper action when a person was panicking and scared. It didn't help that she'd left her expensive sports car at home, knowing the forecast called for snow, and the SUV she'd borrowed from her family's gardener was unfamiliar, feeling big and clunky compared to the low and sleek machine she was used to operating. It spun completely around, or at least she thought it did. North Dakota wasn't exactly a populous state, and the area outside of Sweetwater was rural. Houses or any kind of landmark were sparse. Thankfully, that meant there was little chance of meeting a car coming from the opposite direction. Most people were smart and did their necessary errands before the snow started to fall. For the little bit of time that she lived in North Dakota during her late teens, Ashley knew the people there were hardy and practical. They wouldn't be afraid to drive in a snowstorm like the one she was experiencing, but they wouldn't do it if they could get out of it. That was just common sense. A person didn't drive in a snowstorm unless they had to. Words of wisdom she should have paid attention to. That was her last thought as her car slid across the road in a graceful circle, her temple smacking against the driver's side window despite her seatbelt, before the front end dipped down, tilting into a drainage ditch, and everything came to a stop. Ashley blew out a breath, closing her eyes and wishing she could have the last thirty seconds back. Life didn't work that way. A person didn't get seconds back, nor months or years. Once the time was gone, it was gone forever. She had regrets. That was part of the reason she was currently in North Dakota. But in the last 12 years or so, she'd gotten a little smarter about living her life with purpose in order to minimize those times when, like right now, she wished she could have a do-over. Do-overs didn't happen. Instead, a person had to make the best of what they had and with what they had done. Ashley slumped in her seat. What could she possibly do that would make the best of this situation? She pulled her phone out of her purse, remembering as she did so that it had died on the long drive here and her charger was buried somewhere in the bottom of her suitcase. She was so close to Sweetwater. If it were summer, she wouldn't hesitate to get out of her car and walk to her destination. She might be three miles away, probably less. But not today, not in a snowstorm. She'd end up lost, freezing to death out in the open, windswept fields where everything looked the same, and the thick, falling snow kept her from being able to tell what direction she was going. In her younger years, Ashley would have been more inclined to depend on herself and perhaps use the road and try to walk to town. It wouldn't be far. Maybe she would still do that. She hadn't been planning on going to Sweetwater, exactly. But once there, she would find help, she was sure. But being that she was a little older and just that much wiser than she used to be, she put both hands on the top of the steering wheel and rested her forehead against them. God, I thought for sure when Miss Charlene asked me to come and check out some North Dakota farmer's operation, that was the direction you wanted me to go. 
I thought the emptiness and lack of purpose would be answered by this trip. God, I was so sure of it. Ashley swallowed. She'd been struggling for the last year or two, feeling like her life had no meaning, feeling like she was just going through the motions, making money for her family, being a spokesperson and figurehead who graced the table at various charity functions but had no real substance in her life. It was all show. She wasn't helping with anything important. There was no eternal value to her life. Then, when she'd finally thought of an idea that would propel their company forward in a huge way, her sister had stolen her idea, and her dad had given her the promotion that Ashley had been aiming for for years. God, I can't imagine that a car accident on a snowy day could be part of your plan. But when I talked to Miss Charlene, I felt like you were nudging me. Miss Charlene had asked her to come out and take a look at a Sweetwater farmer's operation. He apparently had some retired racehorses, and Miss Charlene, who Ashley knew from her grandmother, had called Ashley, knowing Ashley's family owned a horse breeding farm and Ashley might be able to use her knowledge to help him scale up. Miss Charlene had mentioned that he had an employee who was a wonder with horses. He felt that retired racehorses could be rehabilitated, taught dressage, or even converted into western pleasure horses or trail riders with proper training. God, haven't you already done enough to me? Ashley tried not to question God too much. The things that had happened at her family's company, the promotion that had been stolen by her sister of all people, had to be part of God's plan. She knew that in her head, but emotionally, she struggled not to hate her sister. How could someone who was supposed to love her steal something that had meant so much to her, that she'd worked so hard for? That was part of the reason that Charlene's offer had looked so appealing. Ashley needed to get away for a while. She didn't want to be bitter and angry, but seeing her sister in the position that she should have been in, knowing that her dad had believed her sister over her, that he had seen how hard Ashley had worked and how Tracy came in late, left early, and never even did her share, let alone put in anything extra, but had still given her Ashley's promotion? Tearing her mind away, Ashley tried to focus on the problem at hand. Getting upset over the lost promotion and the feelings of betrayal by both her father and her sister were never going to help her. She put a hand up to her head as pain flashed down her temple, stretching into her neck and wrapping around her vertebrae, making it hard to think. A tapping on her window widened her eyes before she jerked her head around, sending a new throbbing shooting like drunk missiles across her brain. Someone stood outside her window. All she could see was the outline of their nose as the dim light from the interior of her car shone on it. Fear warred with the pain in her head, clenching her heart and causing her fingers to curl in a death grip on the steering wheel. Had she managed to have an accident in the one place where a serial killer was lurking along the road in a snowstorm in North Dakota? The absurdity of that question almost made her laugh. But then, the way her luck had been going lately, she wouldn't be the slightest bit surprised to find she'd managed to beat the odds and wreck in front of a North Dakota serial killer. Lord? She'd no sooner started to talk to her Heavenly Father than a calming voice told her, It's not bad luck. Everything. Every single thing that has happened in your life has happened for your good and my glory. Trust me. Somehow, those words gave her comfort, and she managed to pry one of her hands off the steering wheel. But prudence being the better part of valor, she cracked her window rather than putting it the whole way down. Slightly surprised that her window still worked, she lifted her head so her voice carried out the crack. Yes? 
The man leaned even closer, and despite the dim lighting, the darkness outside, and the snow that was falling all around, she could see the green of his eyes. Green eyes that sparked a memory, soft and warm and perfect. Maybe that was the other reason she wanted to come back to North Dakota. Tig. It couldn't be. That wouldn't be bad luck. That would be the worst, most terrible, absolute, awful luck she'd ever had in her entire life, despite the perfect feel of any memory involving him. After what she'd done to him, after the way she treated him, how could she possibly face him, thinking he would be anything but unkind to her? She eyed the green eyes again. So familiar. Lord, sometimes I really don't get your sense of humor. Ma'am, are you okay? If Tig had been going to say something else, her crinkled face and the way her hand lifted to her temple must have made him change his mind. Ma'am, do you know your name? She almost flipped her name off without thinking, but then she realized he might be wondering if she had amnesia or at least been befuddled by the accident. It might not be Tig. She might be seeing green eyes, but she knew he couldn't be the only man in North Dakota with green eyes. This more than likely wasn't him. Although maybe she really was a little befuddled, because now she realized there was a slight lilt to his words. So far, he hadn't said many words, but... She was pretty sure she'd caught an Irish accent. She didn't want to have to face him, didn't want him to have the pleasure of turning her down and leaving her stranded in the cold, which he had every right to do after what she'd done to him. Ma'am, I promise I'm just trying to help. Are you okay? Could she pull it off? Could she pretend she wasn't sure who she was? Maybe not have full-blown amnesia, but just be befuddled enough that she wouldn't be expected to recognize him. Maybe she could keep her face hidden so he wouldn't recognize her. God abhors lying. It's an abomination to him. She knew it. She tried hard to be honest and upright, to do the right thing, and she didn't even tell little lies, what the rest of the world called white lies because a lie was a lie, even a lie told to make someone else feel good. And now she was going to tell a major whopper? Despite the guilt that clawed in her chest, she crinkled her face up, wrinkling her nose and keeping her hand on her forehead, where she could feel a bump already forming. She didn't have to fake the pain. That was real. I am... I'm not sure. I promise I won't hurt you. You wrecked in my driveway. I was trying to get my mail before the storm got bad. I promise I wasn't lying in wait hoping someone would wreck so I could... I don't even know what I would do if I wanted to do something unkind. I suppose steal your carburetor? Ashley kept her lips from twitching, managing to keep the befuddled look on her face. She might have forgotten Tig's sense of humor. But that comment brought it all back. He was funny, kind, and considerate. The perfect man. But he'd been poor. Her parents had not approved. Miss Charlene had encouraged her to go for him. But her grandmother, whom she'd been taking care of, and her mom and her dad especially, had told her that she needed to be more proactive in her life. That she couldn't settle that she had to do, have, more. That she needed a man who was ambitious, trying to make something of himself, not content to live in a caretaker's cottage with a little girl he claimed wasn't his, and a manual labor, dead-end job with no prospects of improvement. I... I don't know what to do. At least that much was true. But she rubbed her head, Gently, because it really did hurt. 
and looked up at him with the best confused expression she could dredge up. Being confused wasn't hard. She had so many memories swiping at each other inside her head. So many regrets. So many what-ifs. I could call a tow, but they're not getting anything out here until the storm is over, which isn't supposed to be until tomorrow night. I... I don't know why I was out in this weather. Her voice was halting, and she really was trying to remember what she was thinking. She knew the weather was supposed to get bad. Maybe I thought I could beat it? She was pretty sure that was it. Or maybe she just hadn't been thinking about that, but had been trying to push the thoughts of her sister and her dad and the promotion and all of that aside, and trying to convince herself she was looking forward to whatever it was Charlene wanted her to come talk to her about. She almost opened her mouth and asked if she could make it to Charlene's, but she wouldn't know who she was coming to see if she didn't know her own name. Right? Chapter 2 When both people give 110%, when you want the very best for each other and show your love for each other in the everyday things. Sharon, Oregon Ashley wasn't sure how amnesia worked, other than she was pretty sure it didn't work the same every time. I think we ought to get you out of the car and into someplace warm. I can call my sister, she's a nurse, to find out what kind of treatment you might need. She wanted to jerk her head up at that. Wanted to ask if some of Tig's family had moved to America. She didn't. She wasn't supposed to know who he was. He was right about the tow truck. And if a tow truck wasn't coming out in this weather, she probably wasn't going to make it to town tonight, which meant she would be staying the night at Tig's house. Dread, heavy and hard, like a wrecking ball, dropped in her stomach. But there was something a little electric about the edges of that wrecking ball. It felt like excitement, but it couldn't be. It had to be some kind of negative emotion. She couldn't be excited about spending time with Tyke. Because that had to be who this was. The green eyes, the lilting accent, the sense of humor. Even if she couldn't see him, and even if his voice, at least the tone, didn't sound anything like the twenty-year-old man she'd known, this was Sweetwater, and that had to be Tig. My head hurts. Suddenly she was tired, more tired than she could ever remember being. She just wanted to lay her head on the steering wheel and go to sleep. All this thinking, all these emotions, fear, anger, regret. If you unlock the door, I'll get you out. We'll go to my kitchen, and we'll go from there. Right. She needed to unlock her door. Suddenly, she felt slow and lethargic. Maybe she really did hit her head harder than she thought probably had, if she was actually going to go through with this idea of pretending to not remember. It wasn't something she would normally do. Normally, she was a take-charge kind of person, if not naturally bossy. Her nature was more compliant, but she knew what it took to make her dad happy, and she became a drill sergeant when necessary in order to get things done even if that wasn't her normal, natural personality. She reached for the lock, wondering if the automatic locks would still work. They should. Her window had gone down. I'm going to open the door, okay? Tig's voice came through the window as the locks clicked up at the touch of a button. Yes, I wasn't sure if they would work. That's a legitimate concern. One of the issues with electronic vehicles. She heard a little disgust in Tig's voice. She had always chased after the latest gadgets. That's the way her family was. The newest and the best. Whatever they could use that would further their business. 
They were always looking to innovate themselves and to use others' innovations to make themselves more productive. It was how her dad had become successful. It was how he stayed ahead in a competitive marketplace. She smiled almost nostalgically as she recalled that Tig had been the exact opposite. If you're in an accident and your motor shuts off, or something goes wrong with the electrical system, you're trapped in your vehicle, unable to put your windows down or even unlock your doors. That's a death trap. Tig muttered under his breath as he opened the door and put his hand on her shoulder. I came down my driveway in the tractor. Well, I could probably hook up your SUV and pull it out, but I'm not sure what the damages are, and I'm guessing you're probably not going to be able to run it. I'd rather get you out and take you back to my house. What would she be saying if she truly didn't know who he was? Where's your house? It's about three quarters of a mile back down this driveway. It's the closest house around. Much closer than Sweetwater. Is that where you were going? I... I don't recall. Her jaw ached and her neck pricked. She hated lying, hated it, but she couldn't seem to stop herself. She was such a coward. What was wrong with her? Normally, she didn't have a problem stepping out and doing the right thing. Normally, she had a hard time giving grace to anyone who didn't do the right thing, like her sister. Sounds like you definitely bumped your head. I can see a big lump on the side of your temple. I'm not sure what amnesia looks like, or even a concussion, but I suspect you might have one or both. I can't take you to the hospital in my tractor, so we need to go back to my house anyway. His brogue, not quite as thick as she recalled it, more Americanized than it used to be, still made something stir in her chest, like the way music sometimes came to life in her soul, wrapping around, curling, becoming a part of her. His voice was the only voice that ever sounded like music to her. She'd never experienced that before, and she'd forgotten all about it until just now. Of course, I... I'm sorry to bother you. That was the truth. She wanted all of her words to be the truth. It's not a bother, ma'am. That's what we do around here. He bent down and stuck his head in. Can you unbuckle your seatbelt? Yes, I guess that's what comes next, isn't it? She smiled weakly. There were so many thoughts in her head, but none that were helpful. It took her another second to think about where her seatbelt was and where the buckle was. Moving her hand, she clicked it, the sound loud in the stillness. He reached across the steering wheel and turned the key off. The SUV that she borrowed wasn't new enough to have a keyless ignition, and he pulled the key out of its spot. Do you want to put this in your purse, or do you want me to keep it? She blinked wondering where her purse was. Also, I'm doubting you have any spinal injuries, but can you move your legs? Were you twisted in the accident? I'm not sure what questions to ask to make sure there aren't any injuries that could be aggravated by you moving. But we really don't have a choice about moving you. We're not going to get someone out here before you freeze to death, or come close to it. Funny he should say that, since he'd already started to shiver. Although, whether it was the after-effects of the accident, or whether it was truly from the cold, she had trouble figuring out. The only thing that hurts is my head. Maybe my shoulder a little. I think that's from the seatbelt. Yeah, sometimes the seatbelt does more damage than the actual accident, but it does save lives. I can't believe your airbag didn't come out. I think there's a sensor that's bad. She drew her brows together. She remembered someone saying something about that. That's great. You remember something. Do you remember anything more? Like, who might have told you that? Or maybe you were just confused earlier and you do remember your name? His questions weren't rapid fire. They were calm, like he had all the time in the world to stand in a snowstorm.
get soaking wet as the snow poured down around him, while she leisurely made up her mind about the simplest of choices. But still, there were too many of them for her sluggish brain to follow. She knew the look on her face was helpless as she turned her head to look up at him, and for the first time, their eyes met under the glow of the cargo light. It wasn't hard to see he recognized her after about three seconds. His mouth formed an O, those emerald eyes widened before they narrowed. Something of the sour memories must have been dragging across his brain, because his look became less affable and more closed off. Ashley? The words seemed to be pulled from his lips. His expression, his reaction, was exactly what she had anticipated, but she had enough presence of mind to look confused. What? Is that you? Where? Her head throbbed with each beat of her heart, but she looked across to the passenger seat, like she was expecting to see someone he had been talking to sitting there. She had never been a great actress, but maybe necessity was the mother of invention, or fear. She was afraid of what he would do to her if he knew who she was. Somehow it seemed easier to face if she was pretending not to be herself. For the second time since Tyke had shown up at her door, she called herself a coward. Ashley, that's your name. Is it? You really don't know your name? His voice held incredulity. That doesn't even sound familiar. She didn't want to lay it on too thick. She didn't know what amnesia did to a person, but with everything else that was going on, she just couldn't face this. All right. I think I know your name, but it doesn't matter right now. If you get your purse and anything else, I guess you wouldn't know if there's anything else. If you don't mind, I'll look in the back and see if there's anything like a suitcase or something that we can take along with you. Yeah, I'll get my purse. The car was tilted, with the front end down in the ditch, and her purse had slid off the seat and onto the floor of the passenger side. She reached over, picking it up, wincing at the pain. It wasn't terrible, like she was going to die pain. It felt like a bad migraine. When she sat up, he had disappeared from the side of her door, and then she heard the click of the back door opening. I see a suitcase in the back, along with a leather bag that looks like it might have your laptop in it. Also a small duffel. I'll grab them all carry them to the tractor, and come get you. Do you understand? His words had been businesslike, almost as though he were putting up walls to protect himself from the person he knew her to be. But the last question was uttered with compassion. No matter how angry Tig was, no matter how much he held against her, he wasn't an unkind, unfeeling, vindictive man. Not even a little. I do, she ground out, fighting back the unexpected onslaught of tears pricking her eyes. She didn't expect that. Didn't expect to feel nostalgic and still drawn to him. To still admire him. Although he'd never done anything to kill any of the feelings that she had. He'd taken what she'd done to him, and while he hadn't exactly returned it with love, he hadn't really had a choice since she'd left immediately after. He hadn't been angry, hadn't lashed out, hadn't returned any of her unkindness with insults or half-truths. In fact, if she recalled, the last thing he said to her was, none of that changes how I feel about you. I still love you. Her parents had told her that 20-year-olds didn't know what love was and anyone who tried to tell her that they loved her didn't know what they were talking about. In the last ten years, Ashley might have learned a few things, and one of those things was love didn't have to be a feeling. It could be a decision, a choice, actions. She also had a feeling her parents had been wrong, 
that Tig really had loved her. Not just with the feeling kind of love, but with the kind of love that showed in his actions. There was a sliding sound in the back as he must have pulled her suitcase out, and her computer bag, along with her duffel. The door slammed closed, and she saw his figure moving off in the darkness toward the yellow glow of the tractor lights. She didn't need to sit there helplessly. She had her purse, and she could get out. Trying to find where the headlights were in the unfamiliar vehicle, she finally remembered how she turned them on, flicking them off before pushing her door open and putting a foot out in the snow. Thankfully, even though she had the mistaken idea that she could beat the storm, she had still dressed for it, and she wore boots with a good tread, even if they weren't the warmest things she'd ever had. If she were going skiing or deliberately going outside to do something in the snow, which she hadn't done for years, she would have chosen a different type of footwear, but what she wore would work to walk in. Stepping away from the car, she closed her door as Tig backed down out of the tractor and came across the road toward her. With the car's headlights out and the door closed, the only lights were from the tractor, and they cast his face in shadow while they illuminated hers. He already figured out who she was, though, so it really didn't matter. What mattered was getting through the night and the next day until she could get out of his house and pull her thoughts together. How are you feeling? Hurt anywhere? No. She leaned against the car, though, because the world seemed to be spinning. Or maybe that was just the illusion created by the snow coming down in the bright lights of the tractor. Or maybe that was just the accumulation of all her bad decisions. Having trouble with your balance? She nodded, the small movement of her head making it throb worse. I think it's from my head and the pain. It, it feels like a migraine, nothing worse. Sometimes the pain from a migraine can be pretty bad. I usually get sick in the stomach with mine. Thankfully, I don't get them often. Me. She almost said me either, but she remembered in time that she wasn't supposed to know. I, I guess I don't know if I get them very often, but the pain seems familiar, so I know I get them. Well, that's something anyway. The fact that you're knowing things are familiar. By the way, my name's Tyke. He held out his hand. I am your Ashley. We knew each other a long time ago. You were in Sweetwater for about a year taking care of your grandma. Oh. She looked at his hand. She took too long to think to bring her hand up, since his dropped before she managed to get her limb moving. But obviously you don't remember. So doesn't matter anyway. You've never been out to my house, so nothing there is going to look familiar and trigger any memories. Once we get there, I'll call my sister, who's a nurse, although she lives in Ireland, and see what she says. Going to be pretty late for her, but I think she'll answer. Ashley just nodded, not wanting to say anything. She supposed the less she said, the less she would have to lie. She couldn't believe that Tig was going to help her anyway. And he didn't mention any of the unkind things that she'd done. Didn't throw that up in her face. Wasn't going to make her pay. Maybe he'd wait until they got to his house before he did. She wasn't looking forward to that. But at least she would be out of the cold and could unpack the charger from her phone. And... She still probably wouldn't be able to get anyone to come get her. She wouldn't want to ask anyone to drive in the snow, anyway. Not unless it was an extreme emergency. And while she had had a pretty hard knock to her head, she was sure that it was not a life-threatening emergency. She was a little slow, but that was probably because of the accident, because of the surprise of seeing Tyke because of the pain she was dealing with in her head and all of the other emotions that threatened to overwhelm her. Some rest, a good night's sleep, 
and some quiet to allow her to get her mind in order would be all that she needed. Can you walk to the tractor? Tig asked as he placed a hand on her arm. Yes. She almost said, I think so, but she didn't want him to have to go any more out of his way. Knowing Tig, at least the Tig of ten years ago, he would pick her up and carry her. They would laugh together, maybe he would slide on the ice, and they would ice skate on the road, holding hands and smiling into each other's eyes, their lives full of promise and excitement stretching out before them. Now, now she was just grateful that he had chosen to wait until he got to his house before he told her how terrible she had been. Chapter 3 one thing that makes a marriage last is commitment, in the easy times and in the tough times. Lori Smansky, Illinois Tig couldn't believe that Ashley was back in town, that she had wrecked her car right in front of his driveway. Coincidence? He hadn't heard from anyone that she was coming back. Not that he would, although... He had been in touch with Charlene, who had been Ashley's grandmother's caretaker ten years ago when he had known her. Charlene seemed to have her finger in everything in the town of Sweetwater, possibly even more so in the last few years since her own husband had passed away. Charlene had grieved, sure, but then she had thrown herself even more into making the lives of the people of Sweetwater and its surrounding area as good as she could. For Charlene, this usually meant seeing them happily married. So far, Tig had escaped her schemes and the schemes of the ladies who call themselves the Peacemakers and tried to pretend they were a quilting group, quite successfully. Maybe his successful avoidance was due less to his abilities and more to the fact that he really didn't have anything. Maybe they thought that they wouldn't want to match anyone up with him because whoever ended up with him would end up living the life of a poor woman. He didn't even make enough money to be considered middle class. Not that Ford Hansen didn't pay him well. He did. Tig was the best paid farm manager he knew. But still, a farm manager was a farm manager, and it wasn't exactly a glamorous or high-end career. Normally, he was happy about that, most of the time. He looked at the woman walking across the road beside him, her eyes looking at her feet as though watching every step, even though the road was flat. Despite the fact that it was snow-covered, it wasn't slippery. There was about eight inches on the ground, with more heavy snow coming down. Unless a person was trying to run in it, they wouldn't have to worry about sliding. Still, for someone who had just been in a car accident, even if no one had gotten hurt, just walking could require that kind of concentration. He'd seen people who had been in car accidents get out of their car and start wandering around, completely unaware of where they were. Head injuries could be odd that way. And Ashley had definitely gotten a pretty hard hit to her head. It didn't make him happy to see her hurting. He had loved her at one point, possibly loved her still. Miss Charlene was pretty astute. Perhaps she could tell he had someone in his past that he hadn't gotten over, and trying to match someone up with him would be doing a disservice to that poor woman. Even though Tig was lonely, and he wanted Ellen to not just have a mother, but siblings as well. If Ashley remembered him, he would have felt the need to explain that he had Ellen stay overnight at her friend's house closer to town. School would be canceled in the morning, but if they got as much snow as what they were calling for, school would be open again before Tig had his lane cleared and was able to get in and out. He didn't want Ellen to miss any school, and it was not a hardship for her to stay at Flynn and Katie's house. But since Ashley didn't know who he was, didn't remember anything, as far as he could tell, 
there hadn't been any point. He probably wouldn't have felt like explaining anything if she remembered him, remembered what she had done to him, and if they had had to have that awkward meeting again after having had a really terrible breakup conversation. He supposed he should be thankful for little things, like the fact that he hadn't had to have that conversation without being prepared for it. At least now he could kind of try to think about what he would say if she did get her memory back and remember what she had done to him. They'd reached the tractor, and he put his hand up on the door, thankful that he'd brought one of Ford's tractors that had a cab. His preference was always to work with the ones that didn't as much as he could. He preferred to be out in the open, to feel the wind, the sun, and the cold, but he hadn't wanted his mail to get soaked on the way home, and he hadn't wanted to get his pickup stuck in the driveway, hence the bigger tractor. He snorted, thinking that even if Ashley hadn't had amnesia, if she had recognized him right away as he had recognized her, he wouldn't have to practice what to say. He wasn't going to say anything unkind, wasn't going to throw anything up in her face, and wasn't going to hold it against her. At least, he didn't think so. After all, when a person loved someone, they didn't want to see that person get hurt. Do you think you can get up yourself? he asked, concerned. He should be the one to go up first, because her seat was closest to the door, but he would feel better if he was behind her. Just in case she couldn't make it, he'd be there to catch her if she fell. Her face, scrunched tight with pain, turned toward him, and her eyes, confused and maybe holding a little bit of frustration, met his. I think so. I just feel like I'm walking through cement, like my feet are dragging, and my brain is about three minutes behind real time. I definitely think it'll be good for you to sit down and just take it easy. And I'm sorry I have to push you to even move. You go up first. I'll come up behind you to make sure you don't fall. But once I get up, I'll have to scoot across you to get to my seat. Just warning you because it's kind of tight in there. Okay. Also, there are grab bars, but they're going to be slippery because of the snow. They'll also be cold. Sorry. You don't have to apologize. It's not your fault. Her lips twitched a little, like those weren't words she would normally say. But her smile never quite materialized. Sad, because Ashley had been pretty back when he knew her. But when she smiled, her whole face transformed. She probably wouldn't be considered beautiful by any secular standards, but she'd always looked beautiful to him just because her smile had been so free, so easy, so often. Their personalities had always clicked together. She was a little more driven, easygoing, but still determined to keep moving ahead in life. But she knew how to have a good time and didn't mind slowing down and taking time off. He was the easygoing one, who always reminded her that it was time to take a break. Maybe she pushed him a little and he reminded her to enjoy the little things, and they both appreciated the other, and they balanced each other out. In his mind, they balanced each other perfectly. Obviously, she had disagreed with him. Taking a deep breath, she turned toward the tractor while he pushed the door open. It held, and then he nodded at her. She clenched her jaw, grabbed a hold of the grip bar, and put a foot up. I've got to touch you. He felt the warning was necessary because he didn't want her to get the idea he was doing anything wrong. But he was going to do whatever it took to get her in the tractor, no matter where his hands might land. I appreciate you making sure I don't fall. I feel a little wobbly. You just focus on your feet and your hands, and I'm here to steady you. Maybe it was just his imagination but her shoulders seemed to slump as some of the tension drained out of them. It had to be scary, not knowing her name, not knowing where she'd been going or who she was. He hadn't talked to her enough to know if all of her memories were gone, or just most of them, or some. 
At least she knew she needed to get out of the cold and seemed to trust him. That was a good sign in his book. But he'd feel better once he got home and was able to call his sister. He tried to do the math in his head and realized it would be early morning for her, and she might not be out of bed. But she wouldn't mind. She'd be happy to help. She always was. Sometimes he wondered why his brother had chosen him to take Ellen rather than Trixie. Tig would never understand that, but at this point in his life he was glad, and wouldn't change it for the world. When he'd needed to take a small child to America with him, it hadn't been easy. But the Lord had worked all of that out, and he'd been able to raise a young girl and follow Sunday, the racehorse he'd fallen in love with, to America and he was currently doing the job of his dreams. He supposed he could say that everything he'd ever wanted had worked out for him. Everything except one. Chapter 4 Trust. Without trust, you have nothing. Beth Helm, Waynesboro, Virginia Ashley stumbled, and her butt, which was at Tig's shoulder, came down. He caught it on the upper part of his arm. I got you. Steady your grip, get your feet planted, and I'll push you up. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Just focus on getting in. I'm worried about getting out. That'll be easy. <laughs> You'll just throw me. Have I done anything that indicates that I might be that kind of person? There was a little bit of humor in his tone, which matched hers, but there was also a serious tone there as well. No matter what she had done to him, even if her memories had all come back and she remembered who he was and what she had done, he wouldn't throw her out of the tractor. He couldn't. <laughs> you haven't. You've been nothing but kind. And I... I don't know who you are, but I have come to the conclusion that anyone who's driving a tractor around is not a serial killer lying in wait along the road for someone to crash so they can take advantage of them. I think your brain is working a little better than what I thought it was. That's a good conclusion. <laughs> Thanks. She gathered herself again, and this time she took two more steps and stepped into the cab of the tractor, twisting and flopping awkwardly into the dummy seat beside his. He jumped up easily stepping across in front of her while reaching back for the door, pulling it closed, and twisting so he sat down in his seat. There, not bad, we made it. That's a relief, and I guess I'm not going to worry about getting down. I suppose that will be easier than getting up. Yeah, I think getting down won't be as hard as what you think it will be. I'll go first, and I'll be there to catch you again. I suppose when you started out this evening, the last thing you thought you were going to do was rescue a damsel in distress. I suppose I'll consider you rescued when you're sitting at my kitchen table, a hot cup of tea in front of you, warm and dry. Preferably with your memory back. That would make things easier for him. He wouldn't have to walk around wondering what she remembered. And he wouldn't have to try to find the words to explain to her what they'd been to each other. He hooked the tractor in reverse, backing up far enough so that he could turn around at the end of the drive, and then putting it in gear and turning toward his home. The windshield wipers squeaked as they rubbed against the glass, clearing it about half, although it really didn't matter. Everything looked white. I have been meaning to put some snow guides in along my driveway, but never got around to it. I hope we can tell where the driveway is. Although, it's not like I'm going to be driving off any cliffs if we miss it. We'll just be taken off through the field. And running out of gas somewhere weird? Ashley said slowly beside him. He looked down at the gauge. This is the one tractor where the gas gauge actually works. We probably have enough to make it to the Canadian line, if we don't run in circles. That's a tendency humans have, isn't it? Just circle back and do the same stupid thing over and over again. That sounds a little sad, but yeah, I think it is. Unless we break the cycle. Deliberately. 
Which is hard. So hard. Sounds like some of your memories might be coming back. She paused for a moment, and he wasn't sure whether it was because he had surprised her, or whether she was gathering herself, thinking about what she was going to say. No. She drew the word out. I just feel that. Feel like I've made a lot of mistakes. And you said we knew each other. So I must have been here before. In Sweetwater, yes. That's the town that's about five miles down the road. Never in my house, though. How long ago? She asked, almost as though she just thought of the question. It was ten years, give or take. It was exactly ten years, almost to the day. She had been clear that there was no future for them at the Sweetwater Christmas Ball. Not that he was counting the days, the years, or even remembering the dates. But he was. Unconsciously, he realized now. But he knew. He supposed when something was important to someone, they did count. They kept track. They paid attention. That was probably why women always got so upset when their husbands didn't know when their anniversary was, or how many years they'd been married. When a person cared, they remembered. He didn't know about anniversaries, having never had one. He and Ashley had been together for not quite a year, but they hadn't dated. He hadn't forgotten that after all these years either. Squinting as the wiper blades took off less and less snow, he finally depressed the clutch and the tractor came to a stop. He put it in neutral, making sure the heater was turned on high and was blowing on the windshield. I'll be right back. I'm going to jump out and see if I can scrape some of the ice off the windshield. It might not help anything to be able to see better, but it will make me feel better anyway. Okay, can I help? He had his hand on the door latch and leaned over top of her. He laughed. <laughs> I think the best thing you could do right now is to sit there. Don't fall out of the tractor. That would be the biggest help. Her lips twitched and he thought he saw a little of the old sparkle in her eyes. He hoped her dullness was just the effects of the car wreck and not the effects of a life that had dimmed her happy personality. Life could be hard. It could make people cry, break their hearts, break their spirits, and steal their will to live. He ought to know. Ten years ago, life had done that to him. This woman had done that to him. Even so, he hated the idea that she had been hurt, that she carried scars. He hoped she had met the hardships of life with grace and joy, that she had clung tightly to Jesus and not allowed the things she had to go through to beat her down. It twisted his heart to think that she wasn't the innocent and sweet young girl she used to be. Everyone grew older, but not everyone had to grow bitter. He stepped out of the tractor after grabbing the ice scraper from where he'd set it on the floor two months ago when he started kneading it because of the frost in the mornings. Stepping carefully up on the hood, being sure to hold on because the snow made the metal slick, he worked at the ice on the window the best he could. Maybe he would just have to face the fact that he wasn't going to be able to see, but he couldn't stop from doing everything he could. He wasn't too concerned about himself, especially since Ellen was staying with friends. If he didn't get home tonight, it wasn't that big of a deal. He could stop the tractor anywhere. It would run all night, providing heat, and he could figure things out in the morning. But now, with Ashley with him, he wanted to make sure he got her home, got her warm, got some fortifying liquid into her, and had her rest. He also wanted to give his sister a call and make sure there wasn't something else he could do or some pressing reason to make sure she got taken to the hospital tonight. He shoved the scraper back into his pocket and moved backward, twisting so he could jump off the side of the hood. His foot slipped, his arms flailed, 
His torso shifted and he couldn't catch himself. He landed awkwardly on the ground, his feet down, but one ankle twisted under him. He fell to his knees, pain shooting up his leg, wrapping around his hip, making his stomach clench and tightening the back of his neck. Man, he'd like to have that decision back. I'd rather ride with the windshield covered in ice than try to make it through the storm with a completely twisted ankle. He hadn't heard any bones cracking, although he wouldn't have over the rumble of the tractor motor. Still, this foot didn't feel like it was broken, but he definitely twisted it badly. Dumb. He couldn't remember the last time he'd fallen off a tractor. Of course, the snow and ice made everything slick, much more so than rain. And typically, he didn't drive much of anywhere when it was snowing. His cows were all fed, the horses bedded down, and while he would need to check on them in the morning, he shouldn't have to feed them until after the storm passed. That was why he watched the weather, and was prepared because snow and ice made everything a hundred times more difficult and a hundred times more likely that he would get hurt. Sucking in a breath, he grabbed a hold of the corner of the step and tried to use his good leg as much as possible to stand up. Hot darts of pain shot up his leg, so he put as little weight as possible on it as he moved around the tractor, wondering how he was going to hide this from Ashley. He wasn't. He should just admit it. There was no way he could pretend that he hadn't just twisted his ankle so badly he couldn't walk on it. Gritting his teeth, he forced himself to use it to walk up the stairs. He had no choice. Although, he put as much weight as he could on his hands as he moved his good leg from one step to the other. It was awkward moving around on the step and opening the door. He should have done it before he got up but he'd been focusing on trying not to let the pain bother him. Knowing it wasn't smart to walk on a twisted ankle, knowing that he could make it worse by using it, he felt like he didn't have a choice. Shifting so the door could open, he stumbled in, putting a hand on his seat and one on the door frame to try to take most of his weight while he brought his good leg in. You fell! Ashley's voice held concern. And... You got hurt. My ankle. I twisted it. Can't believe I was that dumb. Dumb? You can't help you fell. It's icy out. I know. I know that's what snow does. I know that's what ice does, too. This isn't my first winter in North Dakota. This isn't where you grew up. She paused. According to your accent. The last was added hastily, like she wanted to explain how she knew. If she didn't have any memory issues, Ashley wouldn't have had to guess. She would have known. They'd talked about Ireland. They'd even decided they would go visit together someday. He loved his adopted country and had passed his citizenship test two years ago. But there would always be a part of his heart that was held safe by the Emerald Isle. No, I'm from Ireland. He wasn't going to tell her all about their plans from a decade ago. Maybe she'd remember eventually. But he wasn't going to get all sappy on her, even if he did feel that way a little. I think any scraping you did on the windshield is probably moot at this point. So much snow is coming down. I don't think I'm used to seeing it snow this hard. We see a lot of snow here, but this storm is big, even by North Dakota standards. That was why he had Ellen staying at Katie's house. He didn't add that, though. She didn't remember anything, so she wouldn't remember Ellen either. But she'd always been good with her, and Ellen had adored her. He put his hands on the steering wheel, but before he released the brake and put the tractor in gear, he bowed his head and said a small prayer. Lord, please guide me home. I was dumb, getting out and not being as careful as I should have been. I'm not concerned for myself, but with a twisted ankle, I'm not going to be able to help Ashley like I normally would. 
he stopped there to laugh at himself. He had been depending on himself to get Ashley to his house, rather than God. Maybe his twisted ankle was God's little reminder to him that God was taking care of things anyway, not Tyke. Got the memo, God. This is all on you. Please get us home. With that little bit of humor, and with the assurance that God had everything in his capable hands, and Tyg hadn't needed to think that it was all on him to begin with, he moved the shifter, squinted through the half-cleared windshield, and pointed the tractor in the direction he thought they should go. Chapter 5 Trust and Communication Michelle from Rigby, Idaho Ashley hadn't been scared before Ty got out and scraped the windshield. She'd known him when he was younger, and he had always been dependable, capable, confident. He always felt like someone she could depend on and who, if he didn't know the answer, could figure it out. But that was when he was whole, not when he was struggling to climb in the tractor, even worse than she had been. Seeing him struggle made her stomach clench and her hands sweat in a way that made her want to grip her stomach tightly and hold on, scared. Be not dismayed, neither be thou afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. She hadn't done much depending on the Lord, not in a long time. She'd been depending on herself. When they'd been together before, Tig had always been good for her in that way. He had drawn her closer to God, not because he preached every day, not because he hit her over the head with this Bible, but because his life showed his constant dependence on God. He hadn't been perfect. She wasn't deluding herself about that. But she remembered always being amazed at how he took what he had read from the Bible and applied it to his life, always thinking about what God would do or what God would have him do, always thinking of his actions and his life in light of eternity. It wasn't that his first thoughts were perfect. It was that he could change his first thoughts into thoughts aligned with Scripture, and he wanted to. She took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Before she could speak, he said, You're scared. And it's my fault. Sorry. No, if I'm scared, it's not your fault. It's my own. God knows exactly where we are, and if he wants us to get to your house, we will. I don't know why I'm stressing about it. So you do remember something? I have all of my knowledge of God. Not that I've always used it. The last sentence was uttered rather quietly, with disappointment showing in herself. When she looked back on her life, she looked back on a lot of missed opportunities, times where she could have done things that would have glorified God rather than herself, and she'd chosen to lift herself up. Knowing that God had given her people that were around her every day, people she worked with, including her sister, and instead of responding with Christian love to those people, she responded with anger and malice. There's a part of me that feels like I don't deserve for God to save me anyway. Well, I don't think any of us deserve it. There's nothing about deserving in the Bible. It's all about God's love, and maybe more about what we don't deserve. He gives it to us anyway because he loves us. Then there's this little thing called faith. She heard the humor in his voice. You couldn't possibly be laughing at a time like this. Seems to me that a time like this is the very best time to laugh. It's the best time to be serious and think about what we have to do. Trust me, I'm thinking hard, but it doesn't mean that I can't laugh while I'm thinking. They're not mutually exclusive. He never believed that they were. He always thought a good laugh made any situation better. And he was constantly trying to get her to not be so serious. He didn't want her to neglect her responsibilities. It wasn't that. 
It was that she could work as hard as she could and still have a good time while she was doing it. He'd taught her that anyway. Or at least tried to. All right, if you want to laugh, that's fine. But you were talking about faith, and I suppose that's even better. It was a good reminder. Timely. Believing that God is going to get us out of this. Believing that whatever it is, whether he gets us out of this or he walks us through it, it's for our good. That's a promise. Good point. Because he doesn't promise that we aren't going to go through hard things. In fact, I think we can pretty much expect to go through hard things. Right. So our faith comes in when we believe that those hard things are going to have a good end for us. Even if we die. Right. That doesn't seem like a great end, but God promises that it will be. So I suppose that negates the need to worry. There's never a need to worry. There's always a need to have faith. And not to change the subject, but I'm pretty sure that's my porch light up ahead. She had almost resigned herself to the fact that they were going to be stranded in the snow for the duration of the storm. In fact, she had considered asking him if he had any food in the tractor, because she had packed exactly zero things to eat. She packed light, in a hurry, just wanting to get away. She didn't even have a granola bar in her purse. But at his words, her eyes jerked up. The sudden movement sent a shock of pain down the side of her face, but she squinted. It's a light. Would you actually recognize your porch light? Well, maybe I am being overly optimistic, because I thought I was heading in the direction of my porch. I suppose it could be my neighbor's porch on the other side of the road, or even Cord Striker's porch, which would be to the southwest of where we had been sitting. But I'm pretty sure I didn't cross the state highway, which I would have needed to have done to get to Cord's house. Cord Striker. Just in time, she remembered she wasn't supposed to know him. Cord's farm and his annual Christmas barn dance had been the last place she had seen Tig. It had been the place where she had betrayed him, hurt him, where she had chosen to do what her parents wanted and stab the man who had been a true friend to her in the heart. Her thoughts felt dramatic, but they were true. You used to know him. Tag's words were casual. They didn't even hint at all of the history that she and he had at Cord's place. Maybe she hadn't hurt him as badly as she thought. Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he'd completely forgotten about them. Most of her hoped that was true. Most of her hoped the pain she thought she gave him wasn't nearly as bad as she thought it was going to be. But a small part of her was sad. She had hurt, not just by hurting him, but by walking away from him, leaving, cutting him out of her life. It hadn't been something she wanted to do, and it hadn't been easy. But it had been all her, her decision, ultimately, even if she was doing what her parents wanted her to. The name sounds familiar. That was true, and the longer she sat here, talking about trusting God and asking him to save her, the more guilty she felt about the lie. How ironic was that? She was sitting here living the biggest lie of her life, and as soon as something was wrong, knowing she was not doing something that was pleasing to the Lord, she was still begging him to save her, help them find some place where they could go to be out of the storm. And God answered that prayer even though she didn't deserve it. What Tig had said about what they deserved had been absolutely true. I don't know how long you were planning on staying in Sweetwater, Tig began. I don't either, she said as he paused. He huffed out a laugh, and she clenched her fist against the guilt. But if you were planning on staying up for any length of time, Cord always has a Christmas dance in his barn. He has Percherons, two beautiful teams, and he and his wife give rides while locals play music. Lots of Christmas songs, but other things as well. They clear off the barn floor and everyone has a good time. 
You'll have to make sure you go if you're still here. She couldn't believe he wasn't throwing up in her face all the things that she'd done. Even if he hadn't been affected by them, she hadn't been kind. It sounded like he wasn't angry or bitter or vindictive. That made her feel even more guilty because of what Tracy had done and the thought she'd had toward her. Sounds old-fashioned, but fun. That's a really good way to describe it. In fact, I might change that but to an and, but otherwise that would be perfect. She grunted, maybe a bit of a laugh, although laughter, even smiling, made her head hurt. It must be a fun town, a small one, sweet water. Isn't that what you said? Yeah, sweet water. And you're right, it's a small town. One of those places where everyone knows pretty much everyone else. And if you don't know them, you know someone who does. Everyone helps each other out. And yeah, we have those old-fashioned quaint things like neighbors and casseroles and... Barn dances. He laughed. Those weren't exactly three things I was thinking would go in the same sentence, but yeah, barn dances. You said there was no one at your house? She suddenly realized she didn't know whether he was married or not. Maybe that was why he wasn't holding anything against her. Maybe because she'd left him, he'd found the love of his life, and he was happily married to her, and he was actually happy that she'd broken up with him, because otherwise he wouldn't have found her. The thought made her breath catch in her throat, to the point where Tig looked over at her. Are you okay? It's just a few more minutes. I was going to park right in front of the house. I'll shut the tractor off and we'll limp our way in. I have all the chores done, and really, other than checking to make sure the block heaters are working in the water troughs, I don't have anything to do until the animals run out of hay, which shouldn't be until at least the day after tomorrow. That's fortuitous. Maybe, or just the way you plan when you live in North Dakota and there's a storm coming. Yeah, that's probably it. She remembered, even though she'd spent only one winter here. They were long and hard and unpredictable, with lots of snow, lots of wind, lots of ice. A person, especially if they were going to be a farmer, had to be tough to live out here. She remembered that all right. Tig certainly fit the bill. Oh, I just didn't want you to worry. Faith, remember? Sometimes head knowledge doesn't translate into actual emotional stability. That is so true, she said, with more feeling than someone who didn't have their memories probably should have. But that had been part of her struggle. She knew that she needed to forgive her sister, to love her, to let it go. But actually feeling that versus knowing it were two different things. Tig let that go as he guided the tractor around coming to a stop with the door facing his porch steps. I'm going to shut the tractor off, and if you don't mind, I'm going to drop your bags out, all except your computer bag. Yeah, I don't really remember what I have in them, but I don't expect you to kill yourself climbing in and out of the tractor getting them. I do appreciate you taking care of my computer bag. I am sure I probably have a laptop in there that means something to me anyway. He grunted opening the door and seeming to stifle a groan as he pushed it open to the point where it would stay. Her luggage had been set on the other side, and despite the fact that he said he was going to drop it out, he picked it up and leaned over as far as he could so that it just had a little drop to the ground. The snow was thick enough that it probably cushioned the fall, and if there had been anything in it that was breakable, which she didn't think there was, it would be fine. I'm going to leave your computer bag here. I'm going to get out without it, help you out and into the house, then I'll come back for the stuff. I'm less hurt than you are and more than capable of walking. I can get my stuff. I'm breathing, so I'll do it. Maybe his words were a little tough, a little bossy. Maybe if she had been a feminist, they would rankle her the wrong way. But as it was, even though she hated to see anything happen to him, she appreciated that his first concern was taking care of her, even if that meant putting himself to the side. 
That wasn't necessarily a chauvinist thing. It was a Christian thing. To think of others before a person thought of themselves. She hadn't even been around him for an hour, and already he was showing her with the way he lived how a Christian could take the Bible and make it a part of their life. It was one of the things that made him different, and it made her love him so long ago. The throbbing in her head had settled down to a dull ache. It was incessant, but at least it wasn't a sharp pain that shot through her body. Although she was still shaking, mostly from reaction, she was pretty sure. She just wanted to curl up, sit down, relax. But first, she had to get out of this tractor without falling and hurting herself or hurting Tyke. He had already crossed in front of her. Well, hopped was more like it, which made her grimace. She hated the idea that he was in pain, but was determined to grit his way through it in order to help her. She had to laugh at the pair they made as he made his way out of the tractor, using the hand grips to hold most of his weight as he moved from rung to rung. We're both all kempt up. We look pathetic. Good thing there's no one for miles around who can see us, he said, not missing a beat. Like he maybe had been thinking the same thing. Miles? Ford Hansen, my employer, lives up in that direction about three miles, as the crow flies, which is pretty much the way I go when I go to his house. If I were to use the road, it'd be five. Wow, and that's the closest. Yeah, but I promise, you're safe with me. He had landed on the ground and was staring up at her. The snow fell down around them, silent but with a gentleness that was almost audible. Hard to explain, but the falling snow was peaceful and soothing in a way that very few other things could be. At least until the North Dakota wind kicked up. I know, you only have my word on that. But truly, we knew each other a long time ago, and we used to be rather good friends. So that's how he termed their relationship. Rather good friends. She supposed that was accurate for the most part. He had wanted to move it into more, and she had too, although he hadn't known it. Still no mention of what she'd done. She had to admit she was impressed. Let me brace myself. Then you turn around and work your way out. Just take your time. Make sure your feet are on the right rungs. They're real slippery, even more so than they were earlier. I think the temperature is dropping. I'm cold, but I can't figure out if I'm shivering because of reaction or because of the cold. Maybe a combination of both. He paused. I'm ready. I'll catch you if you fall and do my best to make sure that you don't hit anything. Thank you. I will do my best not to fall. I don't want to cause you any more pain. This wasn't your fault. I would have done it whether you'd been here or not. You wouldn't have been as worried about getting home. She said those words simply, and he didn't respond, so she figured she was right. It wouldn't have really mattered whether he could see or not if she hadn't been in the tractor with him. Focusing on holding on tight, not allowing her hands to slip on the icy rails, making sure her feet were planted before she moved, she backed slowly on the tractor and down the steps. Before she hit the ground, she felt his hands on her waist. She had to admit it wasn't an unwelcome feeling. In fact, she appreciated it. He steadied her, gave her confidence, allowed her to know that if she missed a step, he was there. And then she touched down on solid ground. Well, on eight inches of snow on top of solid ground. Good job. He kept a hand on her waist as they turned carefully toward the house, him hopping just a bit on one foot. Let's get you in sight, then I'll come back out for your things. I can carry something in. I'll get it. There was a finality in his tone that she didn't try to argue with. Instead, she allowed his hand on her waist as he guided her into the house. Just as he set foot in the door and she caught a glimpse of a rough-hewn table, countertops, and a refrigerator that looked older than she was, 
The lights blinked and went out. Chapter 6 Follow the Lord. Take interest in the things your husband is interested in. Work and laugh together, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. Mary Nizak, Holmes County, Ohio Really, Lord? Tig stood in the door of his house, his foot throbbing the whole way up his leg, making his stomach feel queasy. The woman he once loved, and most likely still did, stood beside him, allowing his hand on her waist, unable to remember who he was, or even who she was, and just wanting a break. Some hot tea, maybe a little soup, a warm bed. And now they were going to do this with no electricity? Lord, I think I might have mentioned this earlier, but sometimes your sense of humor baffles me. He wasn't under the illusion that God and he were buds or anything. Friends, maybe. Friends the way someone was friends with someone that they didn't really deserve to be friends with. But that person somehow loved them and gave them time anyway. Except God didn't just notice him. He loved him fervently and would give him as much time as Tig wanted. It was the kind of friendship that Tig knew he didn't deserve. Maybe he was being too informal with a God who deserved honor and the praise of nations, but he talked to him all the time, felt like they knew each other, or at least he knew God as well as he possibly could, although every day he seemed to learn more. Like today, he learned that God really, really loved to laugh. I'm trying to think where I keep the candles and matches. I think they're in the junk drawer that's to my right. Take one more step forward, let me shut the door, and then I'll help you the rest of the way in. His dog Sadie had gotten up to greet them. The tractor wasn't something that would make her wake up from her spot in the corner on her comfortable dog bed, but the presence of someone like Ashley most definitely was. Hey, Sadie. Then he said to Ashley, My dog just walked over. Be careful you don't trip on her. I can feel her. She's soft. Some kind of long-haired breed. Yeah, a bunch of different breeds mixed together. She was a stray that was part of the litter that they were giving away at the hardware store in town a few years ago. I have my niece, Ellen. If your memories come back, you'll remember her because she adored you and wanted to follow you everywhere. Anyway, she begged for a puppy, and I guess I felt like I was going to be staying in one place long enough that I could have a dog. He wanted the companionship, too. Not just for himself, but for Ellen. She wasn't even a teenager, but in a few short years, she'd be old enough to move out if she so chose, embark on whatever God called her to for her life. Which, Tig had to assume, would not be hanging out with her uncle in Sweetwater, North Dakota for the next twenty years. He wasn't really afraid of being alone, but he did admit to times of loneliness. Sadie helped. Sadie also had to double as the sibling Ellen didn't have. At one point, Tig had thought Ashley and he would be giving Ellen siblings. Back then, Ellen had been a toddler, not even in preschool, and she had worshipped the ground that Ashley walked on. Ashley had seemed to adore her as well, even though she confided to Tig that she had never been around children before. Her parents had not expected her to grow up and be a wife and mother. They had expected her to grow up and take a position in their company. She had been allowed to take almost a year off to take care of her grandmother after college, but her parents had been very determined that she would be going back to the company. I can help you sit down first. He almost walked away, but he wasn't sure how long it would take him to find candles and matches. He had all the animals taken care of, but he hadn't planned for the electricity in his house to go off. He should have, although it had been several years since it had gone off for any length of time. Hopefully, it wasn't off long now. What a time for it to choose to do so. If you don't mind. Her voice sounded weak and tired, 
and he immediately kicked himself for even thinking that he should leave her standing in the middle of the floor while he went in search of lights. Back off, Sadie, he said, his arm coming around Ashley's waist again while he told himself to not feel anything. Nothing. He would feel nothing. He wouldn't feel memories, wouldn't relive them, and wouldn't even notice that it was a woman he was holding now. After all, it wasn't a lover's embrace. He was simply helping her. The sound of Sadie's paws indicated that she had moved away, and he said calmly, About three steps to the table, and then you can sit down. Just take it slow. The last thing you need is to bump into something and fall down. That would be the last thing you need as well. I think your head is more valuable than my ankle. At least, it should be. Unless you're storing your brains in your ankle for some reason. Sometimes I wonder where they are. Never thought of looking there. He thought she almost giggled. At least he could feel her stomach move under his hand despite her heavy coat. He tried not to lean on her as he shuffled forward, gritting his teeth against the pain, unwilling to hobble and yank her off balance. Finally, after a second step, his outstretched hand met a chair. I've got a chair. Let me have your hand. He had taken his gloves off and set them in the tractor after they got down, and she'd never had any. He had not thought to tell her to take them out of the car, if she even had any with her. Because of North Dakota, he seldom went anywhere without gloves from October to April. But Ashley had only spent one winter in the frigid temps and unpredictable weather of the Northern Plains and she might have forgotten all the safety precautions she'd learned during that time. Her hand slipped into his. It was just as soft as he remembered it. And it somehow seemed familiar, and yet totally unexpected. Through the pain, the tips of his fingers tingled clear down to the tips of his toes. He supposed he preferred the pain of his ankle over the tingling he wasn't sure he could handle. Pain he was rather familiar with. Tingles he hadn't felt in more than a decade. Stealing himself, he moved with her, putting a little pressure on her waist, guiding her hand to the chair when she stepped close enough. The seat's right here. You're almost angled right to sit down, just a little bit more to the left. She moved in the direction he indicated, and then when he thought she was positioned, he said, You can sit down. I'll make sure you hit the chair. He thought maybe she nodded, at least he felt like a few of her flyaway hairs might have brushed against his chin. There was a day's worth of stubble there, and he wasn't entirely sure. Maybe it was just his wistful imagination. She sank gratefully down, landing softly, as though she had been afraid that a hard landing would jar her head. She sank back against her seat. Thank you. Her voice was a whisper, and it curled around his heart. She sounded tired, worn out, like she was giving up. She'd always been classy, every inch an aristocrat. At least, that was how he thought of her. America really didn't have aristocrats. But she felt that way, seemed that way. Her movements graceful, her sharp mind intelligent and sure. He'd never seen her quite this way before, almost broken. Don't move. I'll have some light for us here in a couple minutes. Please be careful. Her words seemed pushed out, like she said them with the last of her energy. I will. I have to be able to take care of you, after all. I'm sure that's not what you were planning to do with your evening. <laughs> Sometimes we change our plans because something better comes up. He wasn't quite sure where those words came from. They almost sounded like he was flirting. He hadn't meant to flirt. But it would be better that she took them as flirting than took them as the truth, which was the way his heart had intended. Sure enough, she laughed. I know you're charming, too. I'm not sure I like the word charming. It makes it sound like I'm not sincere. It's just a step up from flattery. And that's not me. He almost thought she opened her mouth to say something. Hope swirled in his chest. Maybe her memories had come back. 
but she didn't speak, and he kept one hand on the backs of the chairs as he walked around the table, leaning on them when he had to put his twisted ankle on the floor. He thought he remembered his sister saying a couple of years ago when Ellen had twisted her ankle, not badly, just a little sprain, that she needed to keep the weight off of it until it healed, because it wouldn't heal correctly if she insisted on using it. He wasn't sure that twisted ankles ever healed completely correctly. Ellen still complained that hers sometimes hurt, and they had done every single thing the doctor, and Trixie, had told them to. Still, he was careful as he made his way around the table, feeling his way along the counter until he grabbed the handle of the junk drawer. Lord, I can live without electricity. I just need matches. Not just for light, but I'll need to be able to make a fire in the wood stove. He had intended to get rid of the stove more than once. There wasn't much wood in North Dakota, and it was more of a pain than anything, even though he'd long ago switched to wood pellets. Still, it was an excellent source of heat during long winter storms and on early winter mornings when they had to go out to the barn and come in and get warm before it was time for Ellen to go to school. He didn't make Ellen go out to the barn with him, but she insisted. She had calves that she was bottle feeding, and she had several horses that she took care of herself as well. Ford even paid her for her trouble. They supposed Ellen was just like him, and loved the fact that she can make a little extra money. It gave a person a feeling of independence to know that they had money of their own. He pulled out the drawer, rummaging through it, trying to sort through his mind as his fingers touched objects. A pen, a notebook, the bean seed packet that he'd put there this spring and never planted, some bolts and nuts, screw, a small flat thing that he got excited about before he realized it was a pad of sticky notes. Hand cream and chapstick that were Ellen's. A baby doll. Ellen hadn't played with baby dolls in years. Maybe it was time for him to clean the junk drawer out. Where had he put the matches? He knew he had several candles on top of the refrigerator. Ellen liked to eat by candlelight. He supposed it was a woman thing, because he preferred to be able to see his food, unless he had a particularly trying day at the stove and had made something that was unrecognizable. Candlelight didn't help the taste in that instance, but at least he didn't have to look at it while he tried to shove it down. He'd gotten better at cooking over the years, though, and it had been a while since he'd had an unmitigated disaster. He still burnt things occasionally when he tried to multitask too much, mostly from helping Ellen with her homework at the table while he cooked. When she didn't have homework, she cooked with him, and in the last year or so, sometimes she cooked for him, which were the times he really loved. He didn't mind cooking, but it wasn't his passion. I wish I could help you, but matches aren't something I carry around in my purse. I usually keep them in the junk drawer, but... Oh! He shoved the junk drawer closed and hobbled quickly to the cupboard. Ellen had had a birthday two weeks ago, and they had a birthday party for her here. He had candles on the cake, and he'd used the matches to light them. There'd been kids everywhere, and he hadn't tried to put the matches back in the drawer, but had shoved them in the cupboard. He recalled seeing them there several times when he had gotten plates out for supper or put them away. He just never grabbed the matches to put them where they went. And, if he remembered correctly, they were still lying in the corner on the left-hand side. As he thought that, he opened the cupboard door and moved his hand along the edge of the cupboard. Sure enough, his fingers closed over the box of wooden matches. Found them. I put them there after I lit the candles on the cake for Ellen's birthday party a couple of weeks ago. Her birthday's around Thanksgiving? Just in time, it seemed like Ashley lifted her voice to make that a question instead of a statement. It seemed a little odd, the way she seemed to stumble, but he said, Yeah, sometimes it lands on Thanksgiving. Since Thanksgiving is always on Thursday, she's right in that span of days where it hits the holiday every so often. And how does she feel about that? Ashley asked softly, almost like she knew Ellen. 
which, if she had her memories, she did. I think she's okay with it. When it's on Thanksgiving, it's a guaranteed celebration, with people and lots of good food. But it's also not all about her. I suppose that's a lesson everybody has to learn in their life, or should anyway. That it's not all about them? That's right. He had carried the box as he limped back along the counter and pulled the candle off the top of the refrigerator. Striking a match, he glanced over his shoulder at Ashley, a smile on his face, along with a look of triumph. Nice, she said, almost as though she saw his need for praise and gave it to him. I was having my doubts as to whether or not we were going to have light. I can't deny that finding the matches made me pretty happy. He paused. It's funny you haven't complained at all about the electricity being out. No point. Complaining isn't going to bring it back, and it's only going to make you miserable because you have to listen to me. At least, I don't like having to listen to people complain. I'm sure you probably don't either. No, I don't. He blew the match out and set the candle down in the middle of the table. I think there are a hundred matches in that box, so we shouldn't be in any danger of running out. There were so many things to do. Start a fire in the wood stove. Call his sister about Ashley's possible concussion and her amnesia. Start some water on the stovetop, which was thankfully gas and wouldn't be affected by the power outage. I don't know what to do first. There are so many things. What can I help with? Nothing. I don't want you to do anything. And I wasn't complaining about all the things I had to do. I just don't usually have trouble trying to figure out what to get done first. And I suppose it's even worse because I know I'm gonna be slower. With his stupid ankle. Why had he sprained it? But there wasn't any point in asking. Obviously, God wanted him to go through this trial. And to go through it with grace, while in pain. He liked to think that God thought that he was able to do it and he wanted to live up to that expectation. That God would give him a hard trial because God knew that he could handle it. That he would rely on God and walk through the trial with grace. Chapter 7 It takes faith in God, in yourself, and in each other and being willing to compromise, and put in the effort it takes to make changes and grow together, rather than apart. Rebecca Hoke, from Southern Ontario, Canada Ashley sat at the table, guilt pooling like hot lava in her stomach, burning. In the last hour, Tig had made a fire, made her a cup of hot tea, found some crackers to go with it, Anne called his sister. He'd talked to his sister while he was making the fire and the tea. She had given him some things to watch for, and he had come over and checked her pupils with a light from the phone he'd gotten out of his bedroom. She hadn't even thought to ask why he didn't use that to try to find matches, and then she realized that he hadn't had his phone on him when he'd gone out to the mail. He explained that it had been almost dead, so he put it on the charger. Sheepishly, he said the one time he needed it, he didn't have it. She had told him that her phone was dead, and they'd laughed that neither of them had a full charge on their phones. Figured. After doing the things that his sister had said to do, and promising to keep an eye on some things that she had mentioned they needed to watch for, he hung up. I feel terrible that you got her out of bed, Ashley said softly. It's not the first time. She's my go-to when something happens to Ellen. I wouldn't get her out of bed for me, but there have been more than a few times where she's talked me down when I panicked over a particularly high number on the thermometer or a cough that I can't get stopped. It's scary to parent by yourself. Yeah. He held his phone up. Do you need to call anyone? I'm sorry, I should have asked earlier. I should. I, I... She almost said who she needed to call. I'm sorry, I forgot that you don't know. I... 
I need to admit something. Had she just said that? But she knew that if she didn't admit her lie right away, it would never get easier. It was always harder to admit that she had lied the longer she let it go. His sister had just told him that amnesia itself wasn't a dangerous thing, that usually a person's memories came back, typically in a short period of time, but sometimes over a greater length, that a concussion was the more serious thing they needed to watch for. She felt guilty and wanted to come clean the entire time Trixie had been talking. You do. And that was another thing. The entire time, Tig had been kind. He hadn't held her past against her or reminded her of what she had done. He hadn't told her what a terrible person she was, hadn't felt the need to fill her memories with all of the things that she wished she could go back and do differently. I don't have amnesia. There. It was out. She said it. He'd been checking the fire, holding the door open and bending over, but she could tell that he froze. Even his breath stopped. Then, without closing the door, he slowly straightened. You don't have amnesia. He said the words deliberately, slowly, enunciating each one. She couldn't tell whether that was out of anger or whether because he just wanted to make sure that he was hearing her correctly. Either way, she supposed it didn't bode well for her. That's correct. I lied. There, she couldn't make herself look worse. She wanted to explain, to give herself grace to tell him that she had just done what felt right in the spur of the moment to protect herself, to offer him all the excuses she felt would justify her behavior. But he hadn't. He hadn't offered excuses for the lights going out. He just saw what happened and dealt with it. He hadn't wanted grace for his twisted ankle. He dealt with that, too. He hadn't even complained that taking care of a stranded motorist in the middle of the worst snowstorm in several years wasn't what he had planned to do with his evening as he handled that as well. So, he drew the word out, you're saying you do remember me. The fire flickered, setting shadows dancing across his face. Maybe dancing was too happy of a word for what was going on in the kitchen. It felt ominous. She held her teacup tightly. The water had cooled enough that it was just pleasantly warm. But she wasn't holding it for the heat. She made her hands relax before she broke it. Yes. Her word wasn't nearly as strong as she wanted it to be. It felt weak, wobbly, unsure. Like she was waiting on his judgment, his disdain. You remember us. Those words were quite strong. There was a thread of pain that went through them. Yes. You remember everything. Yes. When? When did you recognize me? I saw your green eyes looking in before I even spoke to you. I laughed at myself for immediately thinking of you. North Dakota must be full of green-eyed men. She tried to smile, but it was weak. But then, of course, as soon as I heard your Irish brogue, well, it might have taken me a minute or two, because my brain really was being slow. And in that minute or two, I guess I figured out that it would be easier for me to handle things if I didn't have to handle everything. So I lied and I've felt guilty about it ever since. I think it might have been easier for me to act like I still didn't remember. Obviously, I would be sitting here feeling really uncomfortable right now, guilty, judged, and deserving of whatever you say and do. If you need to kick me out of your kitchen... I don't. I wouldn't blame you. Have you forgotten? Was I that kind of person? 
Do you not know there's no way that I could do that? People change. Hopefully in a positive way. That would be a big change in the opposite direction. Some people have changed in the opposite direction. Some people do get worse instead of better. You just spent the last hour and a half with me. It hasn't exactly been an easy 90 minutes. Have I changed in a bad direction? No. Then maybe you could give me the benefit of the doubt. His words seemed rough, like for the first time in all the time that she'd known him, he might be getting angry. Sorry, I really didn't think you had. I thought, and have been thinking all along, I can't believe that as soon as you found out who I was, you weren't telling me how terrible I was. You didn't mention it at all. Just that we knew each other. You didn't tell me what I did. That almost sounds like you might be going to apologize. His eyes bored into hers, and it was like he could see right through her. Would it matter? I mean, I can't take anything back. I can't make it right through words. No, you can't. But I regret it. I am sorry. I've regretted it ever since. I regretted it even as I was doing it. That didn't stop you. No, it didn't. So, what made you confess? He moved a little, relaxing some, looking down at the stove door where the fire burned brightly, not too big, just enough to take the chill off the kitchen. I couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand lying. I've always hated liars. I remember. I feel guilty. Guilty because I was deceiving you. I was taking the easy way out. I was sinning. Especially while we were sitting in the tractor, and I was afraid we weren't going to make it. There I was, praying that God would save us, even while I was sitting on the biggest lie I had ever told. Even if it wasn't that big. Even if it was just a little one. How could I ask God to help me when I knew I was doing something wrong, deliberately, and expect him to ignore that and help me anyway? He does, you know. I know, but he does say that because of my iniquity, he won't hear my prayer. True. And I didn't want anything to happen to you because of me. So why didn't you confess then? Because I'm a coward. I remember a lot of things about you, and I definitely don't remember that. It's true. I should have confessed. I shouldn't even have said it. But I remembered. I remember everything. My brain was being slow, but I didn't have any trouble remembering. All right. He slipped his gloves off his hands and came over, and for the first time, he sat down on a chair. Sadie got up from where she had been lying on the floor, coming over and putting her head on his lap and whining. Without looking at the dog, he put his hand on her head, gently scratching her ears. So, are you going to tell me what you're doing here? He looked down at the dog, then he looked back up at her. And if you don't want to tell me, how about you just tell me you don't want to tell me, and then you won't have to lie about it. There wasn't any malice in his words, but she could tell she had hurt him. Funny, because the last person in the world she wanted to hurt had been the person she'd hurt worst in her life. Nothing but honesty. That's really the way I'm wired anyway. Me too. They didn't have to say that some people weren't. Some people found telling lies a lot easier than telling the truth. She'd been around people who lied just for the sake of lying, even when the truth would have been better. She didn't understand people like that. On the other hand, she supposed there were people who didn't understand why she was the way she was, why she had felt the compulsive need to please her parents, 
and why she had given up the best thing that had ever happened to her in order to do so. Not that it was a bad thing to please one's parents, just sometimes their advice was selfish advice rather than godly advice meant to help. Parents were human too. Miss Charlene wanted me to come. She said there was someone who needed a manager for their farm. Not like what you do. I mean, nothing hands-on. We have a horse breeding farm among other businesses that we manage under our parent company, but I don't know anything about them, about animals or raising them. I remember. She thought maybe one side of his mouth lifted up, but it could have been just a trick of the candlelight. I suppose you could have changed. <laughs> no, I'm still a girly girl. Inside. Outside only when I have to be. Although, you did teach me to love the evening. To love the North Dakota sky. But it's different in the city. I know. Anyway, Miss Charlene said he was looking for someone to do marketing for him. To manage the online part of the business. To see if it couldn't grow and perhaps see if I can be of some assistance. That's what I did with my dad's company, marketing. A figurehead. I can really wine and dine with the best of them. She gave a self-deprecating smile. That really wasn't the kind of skill she was proud of, but it was something she was good at. Reading a crowd. Reading people. Acting the part she needed to. Not lying, exactly, but becoming what she needed to be in order to make people feel comfortable and put them at ease, making them more likely to give her what she wanted. Did Miss Charlene tell you the name of the person you were coming to see? No, she told me to come on out, and she would go with me and introduce me. She said he was looking, and she had told him she had someone, but she wanted him to meet me in person. I see. He was quiet, thoughtful and she thought that maybe he knew who she was talking about. Sweetwater was, after all, a small town. If someone was looking to expand their business, Tig might know it. Do you have any idea who she might be talking about? I do. Who? My boss. Chapter 8 Lots of prayer and perseverance. Also a sense of humor. Nancy Jones from St. Petersburg, Florida. Tig hadn't even considered taking painkillers for the pain in his leg. He wasn't sure why. Probably because he was so focused on trying to take care of Ashley. Not for the first time that day, though. He wondered again about God's sense of humor. Not only had he brought Ashley back into his life, but he'd brought her back and had her lying to him first thing. She hadn't lied to him before, not really. Not with words. Her actions had said she cared about him. She'd allowed him to hold her hand. They'd walk together in the evenings. She acted like she enjoyed his company when he visited her gram, and they sat on the porch sipping tea and watching fireflies. They'd talked about their future. They'd even said they would go to Ireland together. Together. Neither of them would travel with someone they weren't married to. Maybe she hadn't been thinking the same thing he had, but he had assumed that when they went to Ireland, they would be married. They'd never talked about getting married, never even mentioned the word. But the things they talked about were the things that people who were thinking about getting married talked about. They hadn't really been dating either. He'd never taken her out. They'd both been content to just live life together. Meeting on the porch, seeing each other at church, going on picnics, all the time Ellen had been around. And Ashley's Graham as well. Their first date, if he could call it that, was supposed to be the Christmas barn dance. They both knew what a terrible evening that had been. Maybe he had misjudged her. 
He'd often wondered that over the years. He had been more invested than she. He had been much more fond of her than she had been of him. He had loved her. She hadn't seemed to have a problem leaving him. And now, on top of everything else, she was not only back and started off her visit with the lie, but was now potentially going to be working for his boss. Do you know how long you're staying? He couldn't help hoping it wouldn't be long. He couldn't stand it. It could turn into a permanent position. That's what Miss Charlene said. He was quiet for a bit, absorbing that. Ashley could be back to stay. What about your dad's company? Is that why you left? Innocent words that skimmed over deep wells of pain and years of hurt. It's a long story, but I'm not really interested in staying there. And they're okay with that. He said they, because her mom had been involved too. Her dad had been the one that had been insistent that Tig wasn't good enough. Yeah, some things happened. It was obvious she didn't want to talk about it, especially since her face scrunched up and her hand went to her temple almost as though guided by the pain. He felt bad for even asking her about it. As hurt as he was, it hadn't translated to anger or vindictiveness. He didn't want to cause her pain. Trixie said you should stay up for a bit, and you have. If you want to go lie down, I can show you to the guest room. It's serviceable, but not sweetly decorated the way you probably would have done if it were yours. As long as the sheets are clean and the bed is soft. Actually, as long as there's a bed. I don't really care about cleanliness or softness. I just want to lie down. It's been a day. It has, and I feel bad. I can tell that you're upset with me, and I'm not sure what to do about it. In fact, I know there's nothing I can do. I just, I hope you believe me when I say I'm sorry, and what I did then isn't the person that I am now. I'm not holding anything against you. I guess I wish you wouldn't have lied today, and I suppose I don't really understand why. But the important thing is knowing that sometimes I do things I shouldn't. And when I do, I expect the people around me to give me grace. So that's what I need to give you. Grace. Grace that I don't deserve. You always were more like Jesus than any man I knew. Don't give me compliments I don't deserve. I usually don't say things I don't mean. I know I messed up tonight, but trust me, please, I mean it. He was so far from what he wanted to be that he wanted to argue, but he didn't want to cause her any more grief. Let me light another candle, and I'll take you down the hall. His house was small. It wasn't even his. It sat on Ford Hansen's property. As the herd manager, it had been given to him to live in. He was allowed to make any updates he wanted to, and he lived rent-free. It was part of his employment package. Oh, I forgot. Maybe you want to use my phone? Oh, yes. She bit her lip. I have my phone in my purse, but it's dead. The charger is in my bag. At least, I hope it is. Oh, I never brought them in. He had totally forgotten about it. Probably he'd fallen back into the dream, but the dreams of a 20-year-old were much different than the dreams of a 30-year-old, and the 30-year-old had to let the dreams of the 20-year-old self go. I'll get them now, unless you want me to take you to your room first. No, that's more walking for you, and unless I'm going to sleep in these clothes, I need them. My charger isn't doing me any good right now but I'll have it when the lights come back on. Here, you can use my phone to call whoever you need. I don't have your parents' number, of course, but Charlene's number is in the contacts. I'll call her first. Thank you. Her face was still pinched tight with pain, 
but her smile was easy, even if it wasn't very big. Probably the movement of her face hurt. Even if she hadn't lost her memory, he could tell by the nod on the side of her head that she'd hit it pretty hard. His sister had said that the risk of being in an accident by driving to the hospital in a North Dakota snowstorm was higher than the risk that anything was seriously wrong. There hadn't been any broken glass in the car, and there hadn't been any blood where she hit her head. Her pupils had dilated, and several of the other things that Trixie had asked about had checked out fine. Still, he wondered if maybe he shouldn't make the attempt to go to the hospital. I... I probably will want to check on you several times tonight, so... How did he say he hoped her nightgown or whatever she wore to bed was modest? That's fine. I appreciate your care. He gave her his password to unlock his phone, and once she had pulled up his contacts, he hobbled outside. His ankle only throbbed when he was sitting, but when he tried to walk on it, the pain was still sharp. His sister had told him he probably should get it checked out, especially if it were swollen and discolored. He hadn't taken his boot off to check. Not yet. Hearing Ashley's confession that she remembered him, remembered everything, had thrown all of the things he needed to do right out of his head. She was still on the phone when he came back in, his ankle hurting worse than ever, after climbing back up the tractor. He had her computer bag slung over his shoulder, her duffel in one hand, and her suitcase in the other. Her suitcase actually acted as a bit of a crutch. By the time he was back inside, he almost wished he could cut his leg off, because it felt like a bloody stump would hurt less than the pain he was feeling now. He should have elevated it for a bit. His sister had suggested that and ice, alternating with heat as well. <laughs> when he had that kind of time to baby himself. Although, if they were stuck in the house for three or four days, which they very well could be, he would have plenty of time. He would probably be looking for things to do, but outside, away from Ashley. She just talked for a few more minutes before she hung up, pain appearing as tension on her face. Charlene had been worried. Thank you for letting me use your phone. No problem. We can look up your parents' number somehow, if you don't know it. He had a lot of contacts in his phone that he would have no idea how to get a hold of if he lost it. He didn't memorize phone numbers anymore, just pulled their names up. He assumed Ashley was the same way. No, I think it will be okay to wait until my phone is charged. They... they didn't know I was leaving. I had taken off work but didn't tell them what I was doing. That would be an awkward conversation. Yeah, maybe not quite as much as you think, but... He wondered again what happened at her job but figured tomorrow would be time enough to ask. He wanted to sleep on the things he'd already learned. In the morning, he would feel better. He wouldn't be so... not angry. Hurt. Seeing her had brought back old hurts. The things he thought he'd forgiven. The things he thought he let go. The feelings he didn't think he felt anymore. If you'll follow me? Yeah, let me get the candle if you won't let me take my stuff. Sure, as long as you promise me that if you start to feel dizzy, you'll tell me. I really don't want you falling with the candle in your hand. You and me both. But honestly, I'm feeling better. That tea was rejuvenating, and I think I just needed to sit down and calm myself. I think there's some adrenaline that happens when you're in an accident. I think so, too. Or those crackers enough, because I can get you something else to eat. She turned him down the last time he offered food. No, I think it's best to keep my stomach empty until morning. Although... Hopefully, I can impose upon you to feed me then. You're not imposing. Guests are always welcome, whether they park in the driveway or prefer the ditch. <laughs> You're laughing at me. We're laughing together. 
although you are the one who parked in the ditch. You are laughing. Maybe I am. <laughs> you have the right. You really do. No, I don't want to be vindictive. I've never wanted to hurt you. You owe me. Payback? No, God pays people back, and I wouldn't ask him to do that to you. I would ask him to give you grace and forgive you. I think you're a bigger person than I am. No, I just know I've done things I needed to be forgiven for. I think we all have. That was the truth. He went first, his shadow going ahead of him as she followed with the candle while he carried her back, slowly dragging her suitcase behind him. The bathroom is right down there, although I'm sorry you won't be able to have a hot shower tonight. Maybe the electricity will be on in the morning, although he doubted it. That sounds like pie-in-the-sky thinking to me. I know I didn't live in North Dakota long, but I am pretty sure that if the storm doesn't stop until tomorrow evening, we're not going to have electricity until at least the day after. Chapter 9 Talking and acceptance of each other's changes over the years. I've been married 36 and with my husband 40 years. It's a job like anything else, and it takes work to keep it happy. Patricia Slavinsky He led her down the hall, pointing out the bathroom at the end and casually mentioning the door to his room and to Ellen's room as they passed them. Like I said, it's not much, but it's clean and hopefully soft enough to sleep on. He opened the door, standing back as she moved toward him. He rested his shoulder on the wall to take some of the weight off his foot as he waited for her to catch up. Let me set the candle down, and then I'll come back for those things. It was like she knew he didn't want to go in. That was just something a man didn't do, at least not in his house. She set the candle down and came back out. I'm sorry I can't offer you more. A hot shower, a place to charge your phone. Are you sure you don't want to look your parents' number up and call them? No, I'm sure. I told you, they don't even know I took a trip. If they knew that I was stranded in a snowstorm, it might upset them more than it would comfort them at this point. Tomorrow, things will look better. Things always look better in the morning after a good night's sleep. That they do. He didn't say anything else other than good night, which she echoed before he pushed off the wall as much as he didn't want to and hobbled away. There was something that drew him, something about her, something that made him want to stay, want to look into her eyes, touch her face, put his arm back around her, pull her close. The years hadn't erased any of that. And now, not only was he going to be fighting his feelings in that direction, but he'd have to fight the pain and hurt she caused, and raising Ellen in the midst of it all would be even trickier, since now she was old enough to understand that his feelings for Ashley weren't strictly friend feelings. So much to think about as he wondered what caused her to want to leave her parents' company. It had to be something pretty serious. Still, though he didn't want to see her hurt, he hoped that the job Ford had for her didn't work out. He didn't think he could handle having her back. Chapter 10 Being Best Friends and Talking About Everything Roberta Page, Easley, South Carolina Morning dawned, cool and clear and still snowing. Light trickled in slowly as Ashley lay in bed, just drifting, before she finally realized she didn't recognize where she was, and then everything came flooding back. Her lie, first of all, that hit her like a tsunami. She still had a slight headache, nothing a pain pill wouldn't take care of, but otherwise she felt sore, but her thinking was much better, more clear. When she tried to move, her body ached, and if muscles could groan, 
Hers were doing so at the top of their lungs. Still, the bodily aches and pains were nothing compared to the guilt she felt for the lie she told. He had forgiven her. God had forgiven her. And she needed to let it go. She couldn't dwell in it. Just move forward, trying to do better. Unsure of the time, since the alarm clock that sat in the room was dark, so she assumed the electricity was still off, and her phone was still dead, she threw the covers off of her and climbed out into the cold room. Nothing like a lack of heat to make a person get dressed really quickly, even if they had to dig through their suitcase for clothes. Thankfully, she spent a winter in North Dakota before, and she had packed with that knowledge in mind. Warm clothes, leggings, long sleeve t-shirts, a puffer vest, hooded sweatshirts, and a scarf and beanie. She didn't put the scarf or the beanie on, but she grabbed those and the gloves that were in her suitcase before she closed it and walked out of her room. The house was dark and silent, and she wondered if Tig was even up. Maybe the pain had wiped him out more than she thought. Or maybe there was something else going on. He hadn't talked much about himself, not that she allowed him to or asked any questions. Maybe she would remedy that today. Maybe, if they couldn't quite get their close friendship back, and certainly not a romance, at least they could be casual friends. They were going to be stuck in the house together for another entire day and night at least. They should call a truce, although Tig certainly had been kind. So maybe it wasn't a truce as much as it was a willingness to share to be companionable, to act like there weren't deep wells of pain between them. The kitchen was empty as she walked into it, but there was a coffee cup on the counter that wasn't there the night before, so she assumed that he was already up. Sure enough, she'd no sooner tapped the tea kettle with her fingers to see if it was still warm when the door opened and Tig stepped in. Good morning, he said his brogue doing that whole sending shivers thing down her back and making her soul vibrate like nothing but music ever had. She turned, smiling, determined to put her very best foot forward. He deserved no less after the way he treated her yesterday. Good morning. You should have gotten me up. Whatever you're doing, I'd be happy to help, if I would be any help. She had to add that last part because they both knew she was not an outside girl. It wasn't that she hated being outside. She just had never been and wasn't good at anything that he was. He held onto the doorframe as he stood on his bad foot and stomped his other foot on the rug. I guess I'm just going to track snow in with this one. Don't think I'm going to be stomping it. Did you look at it last night? She asked, moving toward him, although she didn't know what she was going to do. He hadn't taken his boots off before she got into her room for the night, so she wasn't sure how he'd done it, or how she could help. Yeah, when I took my boot off, it was swollen, blue, and it hurt. Same way this morning. Actually, getting it in my boot was a bit of a struggle. He grimaced as he said that, and she could only imagine how badly it must have hurt. Her head felt a lot better this morning, but she was grateful she hadn't had to squeeze it into anything and walk on it. That would have been terrible. And there's no way I would have woken you up and made you go outside with me. Not in the dark. Although, I hope you don't mind, but I did check on you about every two hours last night. You were snoring, so I assumed you weren't in a coma. I'm not sure that's medically correct, but thanks. I guess it's nice to know that someone was there. She grinned a little, and her eyes sparkled, even as he sat down in his chair gingerly. Was everything okay outside? Well, because the electricity is out, there's ice on top of the troughs. But it must not be super cold out, because I was able to break through and everyone was able to drink. I'll have to go back out later and do the same thing, only I'll pull ice chips out and end up filling them up some. I also called Ellen and made sure she was okay. She shook her head. She didn't know what time it was, 
but it couldn't be much later than seven o'clock. There was no way she would call anyone she knew before seven. But she did recall that North Dakota was different, in so many ways. I'm glad. She's probably happy that she snowed in with friends. Yeah, she's pretty much living the high life. Although she did question me pretty hard about her bottle babies and wanted to make sure I had heated the water up on the stove and fed them, which I had. You must have been up for hours. Only about three. I slept in until five. Sleeping in until five, she snorted. You're still on city hours. You forget what state you're in. It's all coming back to me. Not because I had amnesia, but because I deliberately blocked that out. He laughed. The hardest part is getting out from underneath the covers. Once you're dressed, you're good to go. If you say so. She knew he was right. There had been more than once that she had gotten up early to do something with him back in the day. And he was right. Getting out of the bed was the hardest. Nowadays, she was prone to grabbing her phone and starting her day with it. But it wasn't the best way, and she knew it. She missed the days when the first thing she grabbed was her Bible. That had been inspired by Tyke. She had a modicum of religion, but Tyg had shown her the value of a relationship with an omnipotent God. I'll cook breakfast, but if you don't mind, I'm going to read my Bible first. You don't have to cook anything. If you just tell me what to do, I'll do it. But I'll read mine first as well. She hadn't brought it out to the kitchen. She almost hadn't packed it at all. Typically, she read on her phone. But there was just something nice about holding God's word in her hand, being able to underline and highlight and write in the margins if she wanted. She could do all of that with her online Bibles, but it just felt more real with the one she'd used all her life. An hour and a half later, they had finished their devotions and sat at the table with the remnants of the eggs and sausage she'd cooked on the stove. I think that smart people in North Dakota will definitely buy a gas stove. Actually, smart people in North Dakota would have a gas stove, a gas refrigerator, and a gas washer and dryer. Is there such a thing? She wrinkled her nose and tilted her head. She'd never heard of a gas washer. I really don't know. I know there are gas dryers. I assume there are gas refrigerators. Stands to reason there would be a gas washer. And if we're really being smart, our water heater would be gas. So did you melt snow for the animals? For the bottle babies, yes. Charlie, an old ranch hand who lives in the apartment above the stable, has been firing his stove and melting water. If he doesn't get enough, we'll have to do more this afternoon if we don't have power and the animals are out of water. I might be able to make it through until tomorrow before I water them, but definitely by then I'm going to be doing a lot of melting on the stove. Hopefully the gas holds out. Whoa, I didn't even think about that. You think it will? I pray that it will. We just had the tank filled at the end of last winter, and we didn't use it much over the summer. When it gets hot, both of us would rather have sandwiches and some lighter food. That made sense to her. When she'd been in Sweetwater before, they really did tend to flow with the rhythm of the land and the seasons a lot more than she did in the city. There, she just kind of did whatever she did, and the weather was just something that she noticed in passing. When she was in Sweetwater, the weather dictated a lot more of what they did. That, and the shorter days and longer nights. That's not something we're going to worry about right now. He settled his gaze on her. She felt caught. How are you? The way he said it made her feel like he truly cared that he wanted to know not just how she felt, but everything. That there wasn't anything he didn't want to know. Crazy that three words could make her feel like she needed to bare her heart to him. My appetite's back. I think that probably means I'm fine. I've noticed you've been moving a little slowly. I assume you're sore. She hadn't mentioned it because she felt bad that her pain wasn't nearly as bad as what his was. The pain pills took care of that and my headache. I think I'm good to go. Good to go and ready to stay. I've been trying not to use my phone much. 
Even if we have an emergency, people might not get to us, but at least we can let them know. I also want to be able to talk to Alan tonight. I did check the weather. The worst of the snow was supposed to be over by dark. So, hopefully Cruz will be able to get out, and whatever caused this outage will get fixed. Maybe they're calling people in from other areas that weren't as hard hit as ours. Most likely. He agreed. So, I'll wash the dishes. Did you have any other plans for today? None other than keeping my foot elevated. I probably won't call Trixie until I'm able to charge my phone. But if she calls me, I know she's going to ask. He seemed to be thinking about something, and then he continued. If you'd like, I have some games we could play. But if you have something else you want to do, don't feel like you have to. I don't. I didn't bring any books with me. They're on my phone, which, of course, is dead. I have a few, and Ellen has a whole bunch, but they might not be anything that you're interested in. I guess I'd rather play a few games. Then maybe later I can think about reading. Really? She just didn't want to waste the time with him. Once she was out of here, she might not see him again. Although, if she got the job with Mr. Hansen, she might be working with him more than she thought. But it would be a working relationship, not one where they would sit at the kitchen table and play games together. There was a difference. It didn't take long for her to clear the table and do the dishes. He had the table wiped and the checkers set up by the time she was finished. Even though she had protested and asked him to stay off his foot with his ankle elevated, she supposed he was a typical male that just wouldn't listen. Or maybe he just couldn't sit still while she was working. She appreciated that, truly, but he'd done so much for her already that she wanted to be able to return the favor. So is this all you do? She asked as she moved one of her red checkers forward. I mean, I know it's a lot of work, taking care of the animals, but is there a hobby or something? I'll do a lot of horse training, but with the storm, I put all the horses where they could get hay and water easily and didn't plan to work with them until we have everything cleaned up. Beyond that, I somehow got roped into directing the Christmas pageant at the church this year. I'm still not sure how that happened, but Miss Charlene was involved, and that's probably all I need to say about that. She laughed. <laughs> Definitely. So how many practices have you had? None. Wow, that doesn't sound good. No, actually, the person who was supposed to do it, who had said at the beginning of October that they were going to do it, ducked out. There haven't been any practices, although on Sunday, when Miss Charlene informed me that I had been selected as a volunteer to replace the previous pageant director, I did manage to get a sign-up sheet out, and the pastor announced it from the pulpit. He also announced that the first practice was going to be Saturday night, which was news to me, but it suited my schedule just fine, since Ellen and I usually have pretty calm Friday and Saturday nights, unless we go to the auction. So it's you and Ellen and no one else? I think you're asking me if I have a girlfriend. He moved his checker, jumping one of hers and taking it away from the board feeling her cheeks heat and hoping that the light was dim enough that he didn't notice. She tried to project calm disinterest. No, I wasn't. She studied the board, not wanting to make another stupid mistake, just because she was curious about Tyke. All right, I believe you, so I won't answer. Do you have a boyfriend? She laughed, and he chuckled along with her, but his question was serious. <laughs> No, I've been pretty focused on work. You know how my parents are. That line was a little bit painful, and while he didn't flinch, he did grimace a bit. Yeah, I have some experience in that. I'm not going to allow that to happen again. I'm not going to get into another relationship where they have any say. It's going to be on my own terms. My parents are not going to dictate what I do. She thought a wise child would listen to their parents, but when her parents had proved that they didn't have their child's best interest at heart, but rather their own, 
she didn't feel bad not taking their advice. You hinted yesterday about something that happened. You want to talk about that? You want to tell me if you have a girlfriend? She countered, kind of unbelieving that she pushed the issue. <laughs> no, I don't. I really don't have anything to offer a girl. Nothing more than what I had back when... Back when you and I were... She was going to help him, but she didn't know what to say. Dating was a lot more than what they had done. He shrugged his shoulder and moved one of his black checkers forward. Too hastily, it turned out, since she had a double jump with it. But as she pulled his checkers off, he jumped hers. Neither one of them was playing well. Some girls don't require much, she said softly, knowing that would have been true for her. Back then, anyway. She really didn't require much now. After all, she was thinking about walking away from a very lucrative job. Of course, she had a little more put back than what she had years ago. She also had more skills, knowledge, and most of all, confidence. Most do. His words did not sound bitter, but somehow they conveyed an idea that he was a little disillusioned. Chapter 11 Laugh together. Make sure God is the first member of your marriage braid, and he enjoys a laugh too. Always put God first by studying his word together first thing in the morning. Enjoy and appreciate the beauty of God's nature together. Sharon Meyer, Cleveland, Ohio Ashley wanted to pursue that line of thinking. Ask Tig if there had been anyone else beyond her. Someone else who had decided that he wasn't enough and left. But she didn't. Instead, she went back to something they had been talking about before. Knowing that he would give her the kind of advice that would line up with scripture and not just tell her what he thought she wanted to hear. A friend like that was invaluable and she wished that somehow she had been able to break things off and still keep his friendship. That would have been almost impossible, though. They had gone beyond the point of being able to remain friends, since both of them had wanted more. I talked about my sister some. I think you even met her when she came to visit Grandma. I did. I don't remember her name. Tracy. She's older than me, but not by much. Only 18 months. She, I guess kids do things at different times, but growing up, she always seemed to be slow, while I seemed to catch on quickly. Looking back, I can see how that probably bothered her, being that I was younger and better at a lot of things. I can see that my parents probably gave me more attention, more accolades, more praise, because... I was good at pretty much everything I tried, while she struggled. Yeah, that would be hard. And my parents didn't help things. I didn't either. I didn't understand at the time that when I got excited after beating her, that she was not just unhappy, but offended, because she was older and felt like she should do things better. She had managed to get one of her checkers to the other end of the board, and he made it into a king. I did better in school as well. Reading came naturally to me. I don't remember learning. I just knew how. She struggled. She had homework every night, and I remember her crying over it while Mom tried to help her. Math came easily to me. I sailed through algebra, loving it. I did well in the higher maths as well, while she failed algebra once and had to take it over. That was probably really hard for her, but I didn't understand. Yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. Kids really are so self-focused. That's a point of maturity, when pleasing yourself and taking care of yourself is not the most important thing in your life, but rather you look around and you see others. When you're interested in them, talk to them about what they're interested in and not expect life to be about you. You think about how you can help them. Yeah, 
and not with grand ideas of helping people you barely know. That's easy. But sticking with the people God has placed in your life, like your parents or siblings, friends, the people you work with every day, looking to see how you can be a blessing. She shook her head. It took me a long time to learn that. My sister had already graduated from high school and was off to college before I really even had an inkling of how terribly I treated her. Not on purpose, but just never understanding her struggle. I thought she just needed to work harder. That might have been a part of it. But again, I don't think you should be so hard on yourself. You didn't know. No, but I never apologized. It just felt like things were so competitive between us. She saw everything I did as competing against her, and I didn't understand how to make her see that I wasn't competing against her. I just always tried to do my best. It wasn't beating her that drove me. I was pushing myself to be the very best that I could be. I see that in you. Easily. That's definitely who you are. Yeah. Anyway, she resented me, and she always wanted to try to be me. She claimed she wasn't competitive, that it was me, but I would walk away just so that she would win, and she never saw. Somehow he managed to jump two of her kings, leaving him with two kings and two regular checkers on the board to her three kings. She studied the board, trying to come up with a strategy but in reality, she was thinking about what she was saying. Anyway, we both worked in the business, and I think for a while, it was almost like we declared a truce. We both felt like adults, and we could put our childhood behind us. But maybe that's not the way it was. Maybe she was just manipulating me. Because I confided to her about a great idea I had. I wanted to pitch it to Dad and I knew if he saw my vision, he would give me a huge promotion and put me over the project as supervisor. I'd certainly put my dues into the company. Sure have. There was no irony in his tone, although there could have been. She'd given him up for the company. She wanted to tell him that if she could go back and do it over, she would give the company up for him, that she'd made the wrong choice. because. He was worth far more. But she didn't. Anyway, as you probably guessed, she stole my idea, pitched it to my dad, and even though she didn't have any experience in doing what I suggested, he gave her the promotion, and now she's doing the job that I wanted. Wow, that hurts. Yeah, I guess I was angry at my sister angry at my dad. But I was angry at God, too, because, you know, she had no experience. She should have failed, and yet it's working out for her. Somehow she's making it a success. And that frustrates me even more. She should have fallen flat on her face, not that I was rooting for her, too. Normally, I rooted for her success, but since she had stolen my idea, I felt like it was only right that she not be successful at it. He lifted serious eyes to her, understanding, but there was also wisdom there. But that is not what God had for you. Right. He had other lessons for me. It was a pride thing. You hit it right on the head. It's hard, but it's absolutely true. It was a pride thing. I had gotten to the point where I thought I could do anything better than she could. And as she's successful, it burns, especially since I feel like she doesn't deserve it and somehow I do. She sighed. <sighs> of course, it's only been a couple of months, but she hasn't fallen flat on her face on the first day like I thought she would. It made me reevaluate things. I see. I think that's the important thing. When these kind of trials come into our life, we don't resent them, kick against them, wish that we were somewhere else, or that God would get us out of them. But instead, 
we look around and see that he wants us to learn. And then we hunker down and learn it. It sounds so easy. She shook her head as he jumped her last checker. But true to his nature, he didn't gloat. Just said, want to play again? She nodded. We have to, since I need to beat you. And she's not competitive. It's the sister. She wanted to stick her tongue out at him. He brought out the young girl in her. But she didn't. Seriously, I'm willing to play again if you are. There's nothing else to do. That made her feel a little sad. A little hurt, maybe. That he wasn't saying, man, I'm enjoying this time with you. It was more, you're my last choice, so I might as well make the best of it. What more could she expect after what she'd done? So it almost feels like you quit because of sour grapes and are out here looking for a job rather than working in your parents' company because you're mad. I knew I could count on you to not sugarcoat things for me. I don't want someone patting me on the back and telling me what a poor baby I am. I want someone who's going to tell me what I should do, the unvarnished truth. In a kind way, hopefully. Very kind. She waited for him to move first, since she'd gone first the last time, and then she moved her checker out before she continued explaining. It's not about sour grapes, not really, although I admit maybe it was at first. But I didn't call Charlene, she called me. I had been at my job doing what I was supposed to be doing, but asking God why. Why hadn't I gotten that promotion? Why hadn't I been given the opportunity to do the things that my sister was now doing? I was the one who would work for that. It was my idea. She moved again and then looked up at him, hoping he would understand. When Miss Charlene called, I felt like that was God saying maybe being at my parents' company wasn't what he had planned for me. Maybe he had something else planned. So I told Miss Charlene, yes, that I would come out and check things out. Then I took a month off because I was such a workaholic I never used all of my vacation and I decided that I would come up and see. See if this is what God wanted me to do. See if that was why I didn't get the promotion. Hmm. He made a sound that was non-committal. Maybe she should be completely honest. After all, she started out when she'd first seen him yesterday not being honest. Maybe, maybe I never stopped regretting that I had left to begin with. He had been studying the board, probably thinking about strategy, but his eyes shot up to meet hers at that statement. His gaze narrowed, and his lips pursed before he said, Really? It's been a long time. More than a decade. Are you just now doing something about the fact that you regret what you missed out on? Then he shook his head, grunting. <sighs> and it wasn't like you missed out on a lot. I already told you there wasn't anything here. There still isn't anything here. I don't own this house. It's part of my job benefits. I don't have a huge amount of money in the bank, and I don't want a huge amount of money in the bank. I don't want to be filthy rich. I don't want the pressure of money. Seems like people who get money just want more. Not very many people love something enough to cross an ocean for it. Well, I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. I'm just saying you have things that normal people maybe don't. Money isn't everything. Sometimes loyalty, dedication, a commitment that one refuses to break are far more important than any material goods you might have or not have. He wasn't even trying to look at the checkerboard anymore but met her gaze steadily over the top of it. Maybe she hadn't even articulated that to herself, but that was what drew her to him. It wasn't the money. She knew he didn't have any. At least, she hadn't expected him to have somehow fallen into it since she'd last known him. But he had things that were worth more than money. 
character, a great work ethic that got him up at five o'clock in the morning and called it sleeping in, that fed the animals before he fed himself, that took care of anyone who crossed his path, including someone who had hurt him and walked away from him without an explanation. He didn't seem to know what to say, and after staring at her for a while, he looked back down at the board. Maybe her words had upset him, because from that moment on, she beat him easily and still had six checkers left on the board when she jumped his last king. My leg's hurtin'. She didn't think he needed to lie down any more than she did, but she figured he wanted to get away from her. And who was she to deny that? After all, he'd allowed her to walk away. Not that he had a choice. She hadn't even been around for him to beg her to stay. Without saying anything, she gathered up the checkers, putting them back in the bag and laying the board in the box. Is it okay if I walk outside? She hated asking, on the off chance that he would tell her no. She didn't really think he would, but she was too restless to stay in. You need to be careful. I wouldn't get out of sight of the buildings. You can lose your way pretty easily and end up lost. And I don't mean that as an insult. It could happen to me just as easily as you. I get it. I'll make sure I can see the buildings at all times. Looks like the snow might have let up a little bit. But there's supposed to be some heavy bands before it tapers off this evening. Got it. Also, don't be surprised if you see Charlie. He lives above the stable, and he'll be out and around. Slowly, because he's an old bull rider who's all stoved up, but he lives on the farm and helps me. Charlie, does he want to come in the house? She felt bad that he was out there all alone. Trust me, if he were willing to come in the house, there wouldn't have been a spare bedroom available for you. But no, he says he wants to be out with the horses, because he can't stand the clean house smell. And horse company doesn't talk back. He grinned. He has a nice apartment, even if it is above the stable. Ha, <laughs> don't talk back when I'm talking to Charlie. Got it. He'll be nice to you. He likes women. That's good to know. She pushed back away from the table, standing to her feet. Thanks for playing with me for a bit. Maybe after we rest for a bit, we can do something else this afternoon. Play a tiebreaker, or break out the Chinese checkers. I haven't played Chinese checkers since the last time I was in North Dakota. Seems to me you might be pretty good at it. Maybe I better pass on that one and see if I can talk you into a game of chess. Chess is a little above my IQ level, and you know it. It is not. You just hadn't ever played when I taught you how. Everyone gets better the more they play. Well, I haven't played much in the years since you taught me. Every once in a while, Ellen and I get into a match, but they never last long. Neither one of us is any good. I see. So we'll have to play both. One you're good at, and one I'm good at. Later. She thought it was a good compromise, and he shrugged his shoulder, jerking his head before limping toward his bedroom. She put the game back on the shelf where he'd gotten it from, and then put her boots and coat on and walked outside. Chapter 12 Remembering to Laugh and Forgive and Pray Betty McIntosh South Carolina. Charlie sat by the stove, his joints aching. He could be upstairs in his apartment, but it was warmer in the tack room right by the stove, and he was closer to the horses this way. There was just something about horses that soothed a man, whether it was their smell or their graceful movements or the friendship they offered without judgment. Not all horses. Some of them got a little moody. Speaking of moody, his head jerked up as the door opened, surprised that Tig would be coming back out. He had said he had a woman in the house with him, and Charlie didn't expect to see him until it was time to feed that evening. He had a pot of snow on the stove, and several more sitting around, 
and every available container they had filled with snow which was slowly melting. Hopefully they'd have enough water to feed the stock. Tig was probably coming out to check. Charlie gritted his jaw. He was going to give that boy an earful. He twisted his ankle, and he needed to stay off it. Hadn't he already told him this morning that if he didn't take care of himself, he'd end up a stoved-up old man just like Charlie was? But the head of steam he was building up melted away as he saw that it was not Tig coming through the door, but most likely the girl he'd said was staying with him. No wonder Tig had been tight-lipped about her. She was pretty. Rosy cheeks, sparkling eyes, and although he couldn't see her figure underneath the coat, she moved with a grace that seemed old-fashioned and yet aristocratic as well. He hadn't done much talking to women in his lifetime. He'd gotten one to marry him, only to divorce him a few years later, and he never got up the gumption to try the whole marriage thing again. There were times he definitely wished he had. He wouldn't mind a good woman, one who wasn't afraid to tell him what to do and who would keep him from eating his own cooking every once in a while. Although, Tig had been making sure he hadn't had to do too much of that over the last few years. Not since he landed at Fort Hansen's place. Old cowhands didn't always have a welcoming spot once they were too old to ride and work a full day. Too old and too stoved up. No woman would ever have him, particularly unless he was willing to move out of the barn. He supposed, for the right woman, he'd be willing. You must be Charlie, the lady said, her smile giving a promise that if she ever actually gave him a full smile, he would hardly be able to stand it. And you must be the woman that parked her car in the ditch last night, Charlie said, his voice gruff but his expression gentle. He'd always had a soft spot for women and children. That would be me. And I'm also the reason that Tig has a twisted ankle today, no matter what he told you. He told me he twisted it when he fell getting off the hood of the tractor after scraping the windshield. But he wouldn't have been scraping the windshield if I hadn't been with him. So it was my fault. Hmm, I see. Well, I like someone who's capable of taking responsibility for herself. He nodded to the chair on the other side of the stove. You can sit down if you want to. I guess I will. I was just feeling a little claustrophobic inside. <laughs> you mean you and Ty had an argument? He didn't bother to try to hide his grin. He knew how those things went. It was obvious from talking to Ty that he had feelings for the woman because he had studiously tried to act like he didn't. Charlie watched the woman as her cheeks reddened, even as her head shook a no. Tig is the kindest and most considerate person around. It would be almost impossible to get into an argument with him. But we do have some history, and I hurt him. She ended abruptly, pressing her lips together and crossing her arms over her chest as though to protect herself. She plopped down in the chair. I've never seen anyone who could forgive like Tig can. In fact, it's pretty hard to get him riled in the first place. He's got more patience than any man I've ever seen. I think that's what makes him so good with the racehorses. I tell him he's wasting his talent here on the farm. He could be working for some high-dollar stable, training champions, and making big bucks. But instead... He's wasting his talent here. Wasting his talent, but not wasting his life. There was a difference to Charlie, at least. My family has owned several racehorses, and I've often thought of him. But back when I knew him, ten years ago, he said he wouldn't do that because, first of all, he had followed the racehorse that he loved here and didn't want to part with him. But more than that, he knew that the environment around the track was not good for Ellen, and he refused to leave her. <laughs> That's exactly what he told me. He's got more patience than any man I know, but he's also got a huge amount of commitment. I've never met someone who gets so attached to something and just won't let it go. Charlie shook his head. 
That's not a bad trait, the woman said, holding her hand out over the top of the stove. By the way, my name is Ashley. Tig told me earlier, but I admit, I'm an old man and I forgot. He took the hand she offered, soft and white, and thought that she probably wasn't a great match for Tig. He needed a woman who could work alongside of him, or at least a woman who could work. He had a hard job, outside in the unforgiving North Dakota heat and in the worst North Dakota cold. He would be better off with a woman who could handle those extremes with him, because a man needed a woman who would help him rather than hinder him. Of course, Tig being what he was, if he'd fallen for this girl, there would be no talking him out of it. And she seemed nice. Charlie could see what Tig saw in her the kindness and the hint of humor in her gaze. I didn't say it was a bad trade, but it might have kept him from doing more good in the world. Isn't he doing enough good by raising his niece and making sure she has an environment that's conducive to what a little girl needs and protecting her from the things that she shouldn't be exposed to? It was a sacrifice on his part. I hope she appreciates it. He didn't want his words to be taken wrong, so he allowed a smile to break through the whiskers on his face as he added, She's a sweet girl, and if she were mine, I would hope I would make the exact same decision as Tig did. It was the right one, even though there are horses that aren't champions because Tig wasn't able to work with them. Ashley smiled, nodding her head, and Charlie thought again that maybe his first impression was wrong. She was a woman who could work. Just some people were born to it. Some people had to ease into it, had to choose it. Those people were probably even more suited to the work than people who didn't have a choice. After all, if someone chose North Dakota, they did it out of love. Certainly, they didn't do it out of a desire to live an easy life. So, where's Mrs. Charlie at? Ashley asked, pretending to look around for his wife. There was a Mrs. Charlie once, a long time ago. She wasn't Mrs. Charlie for very long, and I guess I got burned bad enough on that one that the idea of trying another one turned my stomach sour, and I could just never get myself to do it. She nodded, looking at the buckets of water on the ground. Are these for watering the horses and cows later? They are. As they melt, I've been filling them back up with snow. I think we'll have enough to take care of them tonight, and we'll start melting them again tomorrow. That's what farm work really is. Pretty much do the same thing day in and day out. In other words, you really have to live it in order to do it, Ashley said, like she understood. Charlie might have talked to her a little more. She was easy to talk to and didn't seem to be offended if his manner was a little bit gruff and he was pretty sure by the tone of her voice and the way her eyes got a little dreamy that her feelings for Tig were pretty much the same as Tig's feelings for her. He wished he could push them together a bit, but, old man that he was, he had no idea what he could say or do that would make her want to be with Tig. He wasn't sure even exactly what she needed. Is that a tractor? she asked tilting her head and seeming to strain to listen. It is. Good ears. He could just barely hear a rumbling as he set four legs back on the floor and stood up from his chair, slowly giving his joints a chance to acclimate to the new position. The older he got, the more acclimation time they needed. Who would be coming with the tractor in the snow? Charlie grinned. That has to be Ford Hansen. No one else is crazy enough to do that in this kind of snow, especially with it still coming down, too. But Ford's just a little bit nuts, if you know what I mean. Ashley's eyes widened, and he was pretty sure she was going to say she had no idea what he was talking about when the noise of the tractor got louder, and just a few seconds later, the door burst open and Ford Hansen walked in. He wore an eye patch, but one side of his face was scarred and wicked-looking. 
didn't bother Charlie, never had, although it did take a little bit of getting used to before a person didn't startle every time he saw it. He had to give Ashley credit. Her eyes widened even more, but there was no other expression on her face as she stood, looking at the man who stood staring at her. Charlie, I didn't know you had a visitor. I don't. I'm entertaining Tig's visitor for him. That's nonsense, Ashley said as she walked around the stove, holding out her hand. Ford shook it with his deformed appendage. If Ashley noticed, she didn't comment. And she had to have noticed. I'm Ashley. I wrecked my car last night, and Tig brought me back to his house, giving me his spare bedroom. I heard the electricity is out. It is. Her brow furrowed and Charlie hit a grin. How did you know? There is an old man who lives here who's getting a little soft in his old age. I wanted to make sure that someone was going to be fixing it soon. Apparently, the fellow likes his hot showers. Ford's good eye twinkled as he looked over at Charlie. When it gets cold like this, my rheumatism acts up and hot water helps. He knew he sounded a little defensive, but it was true. Like I said, soft. Ford grinned, taking any sting that might have been in his words completely out. My wife and kids and I filled up a couple of tanks of water, because we do have electricity, and I was going to water the stock for Tig. I also heard that he twisted his ankle, so I figured I'd feed too while I was on it. Think he'd better stay off of it. And if you want him to stay inside, you better send the lady in to hide his boots because I guarantee you as soon as he heard the tractor, he got up from whatever he was doing and started putting them on. Then you get going. I don't want him on that ankle, not until the doc looks at it and gives us his opinion, or at least keep him off of it for a couple of days. Charlie almost snickered, because Ford knew as well as anyone that Tig was not going to go to a doctor to see about his ankle. Not any more than Ford would if he'd broken it. As long as they could still walk on it, they wouldn't be getting it looked at. All right, I'll hide his boots if he hasn't gotten to them already. You do that. You tell him to stay in for the rest of the day and tomorrow. I'll get you guys plowed out and call a tow for your car, and then you can get going to wherever you were planning to go. If Charlie had to guess, that was disappointment that crossed her face. He swallowed another snicker. He hadn't been this close to giggling since grade school. It was almost comical to see the disappointment on her face. Actually, I'm here to see you. Miss Charlene was going to introduce us after the storm. Oh. Ford stopped, his brow raised. You must be the woman Miss Charlene told me about. The one who might be able to fill the job I'm thinking of promoting the farm and working with Tig on increasing the sales of our Highlanders and giving him more time to work on training the retired thoroughbreds. Yes, I have a portfolio put together, and I can answer any questions you have. I definitely think I can increase your online presence and put together a powerful marketing package for you. Sounds good. I am interested in talking to you about it. He slapped his hands down his legs. But not now. Go head Tig off. Tell him I don't want to see him out here. You could tell him I'll fire him if he comes out, but he'll just laugh at you. Probably hiding his boots is your best bet. Throw them out in the snow if you need to. His words made Ashley gasp and then laugh, and Charlie had to laugh along with her. He's a good man, but stubborn. Stubborn, committed, determined? full of perseverance? I suppose negative and positive traits, depending on what you're using it for. She lifted her brows, and Ford nodded. Exactly. Charlie figured Ford knew what Ashley was talking about because he was the exact same way. A man too stubborn for his own good, determined to make his way in the world on his own terms, having to be humbled so he could see God. A man like that? One who would turn fully to the Lord? 
was a force to be reckoned with. Chapter 13 Communication, Quality Time, and Understanding Your Spouse's Needs and Inner Workings Jessica Lowry, Missouri Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Although I could have done it myself. Ty lifted a brow at Charlie, who had the grace to look guilty. I know you could have. I wouldn't have wanted you to. I appreciate Charlie saying something. You work hard and hardly ever take any time off. And, Ford put a hand up, anticipating Tig's protest. I know you love what you do. I know you love the animals you work with. I know you consider it a blessing and appreciate being able to be here, to take care of Sunday, and to have a job. I've heard it all before. But you know, I appreciate you, too. A man who's dedicated to his job, that I can depend on, that I don't have to follow around to make sure my animals are being cared for, that they aren't being abused, starved, or going without water. That kind of man is hard to find. I have that in you, and I want to take care of you. Tig swallowed. Ford didn't often get emotional and certainly not with him. But unless he was mistaken, Ford's eyes were watering just a bit. You need to go home to your wife and kids. I'm sure you got things to do around your place. The snow isn't going to be stopping any time. There's a lot of plowing to do. And I have a lot of kids to do it for me. That's what we have them for, isn't it? Tig grinned and shrugged. I guess I was dumb because I sent my right hand away. But you have someone in the house who needs you. She seems like a good girl. I understand you guys have some history, too. Yeah. Tig didn't want to say any more. He let her go once. We ought to make sure she doesn't get away a second time. She chose to leave. It wasn't like I lost her. He couldn't keep the hardness out of his tone. He didn't like the idea that he had done something that had caused her to slip away. He would have held tight to her if he could have. But even though he was the kind of person who didn't walk away from things easily, he also understood that a man couldn't make a woman love him. He couldn't make them stay if they didn't want to. In fact, true love often meant letting go, as hard as that was. That was what he had done with Ashley. He wasn't going to fight her family for her. He wasn't going to make her choose between affection for her parents and the desire to please them, make them happy, and whatever they might have had between them, especially when he had so little to offer her. But regardless of whether he had a fortune or not, she shouldn't have to choose between people she loved. And he wasn't going to make her feel guilty, like she was in the middle of a tug of war. Well, she's back. Maybe you want to make the most of that chance. I, I was going to offer to let her move into my house, at least until the snow was over and the lights are back on and she can make it to town. But... Ford grinned, a little sly. I kind of thought I'll just let things go. Charlie froze for a moment before he started guffawing, slapping his leg and laughing as hard as Tig had ever heard him. Tig just shook his head. Someday I'm going to tell her what you did. She could have slept in warmth and comfort tonight, but instead you made her stay with me. I could be wrong, but I think she'll thank me if you do tell her. Not tonight. Maybe not next week, but by next year? Yeah, I think she'll be thanking me. You too. I'm thanking you now. I could have done the work, but I know my ankle appreciates the fact that you did. That's what friends are for. Ford slapped his back, then he started for the door. I'm gonna head out. Do you have battery in your cell phone? I do. Call me if you need anything. Seriously, call me. He started to walk away again, then he threw over his shoulder. Don't get out of bed in the morning before seven. I'll be here, I'll take care of it. 
You keep that ankle elevated and get better so you can get back to work. If Ashley does what I think she's going to, it's going to put more work on you. Of course, I'll be hiring people, but you'll be in charge of training them and supervising them. Maybe less manual labor, but still just as much work. I'd love to see it take off. And that was the truth. The Highlanders were great cattle, and Ellen had fallen in love with each and every one of them. The miniatures didn't take up much room, and they would make great pets for people who were interested in that type of thing. He was excited about the possibilities. Ford left, and Tig said a few more words to Charlie before he took the crutch that Charlie had dug up from when he had fallen down the stairs a couple of years ago and used it to walk toward the house. The snow was well over two feet deep, and it was slow going. The crutch allowed him to take a good bit of weight off of his leg, though, and while he was winded by the time he got to the porch, he wasn't in quite as much pain as he had been at times in the past day. To his surprise when he got in, Ashley was standing at the stove stirring something, something that smelt good. His stomach growled. She turned around. Did you guys get everything watered? We did, and you're not mad at me. She had been pretty strident and insistent that he not go out, and he had been just as insistent, or more so since he won, that he would. She had her arms crossed over her chest and her jaw gritted the last time he saw her. No, why would I be mad? Because you wanted me to stay in, but I don't want to fight about it. Just happy that you're talking to me. So I don't get my way, and you think that's going to make me mad? Doesn't that usually make people mad? In his experience, when something didn't go right, people got angry. Of course, he didn't have a ton of experience, but she certainly hadn't looked happy with him when he walked out earlier. I told you what I wanted, and that didn't work for you. I guess I don't see the point in getting angry about it. She shrugged, like it wasn't a big deal. But I suppose I was a little restless, so I looked in your cupboards and freezer and grabbed some meat. I'm thanking God for that gas stove. And that the gas has been holding out. We didn't have to use it to melt water today, so that was awesome. No, it was also nice to meet Ford. I think he will be a really great person to work for. He absolutely is. Today is a good example of that. He didn't have to come over and feed for me. He's the boss. But he did it, because he knew I'd hurt my ankle. Actually, he might have done it anyway, since they have electricity over there and were able to fill several tanks with water. Are you sure he's going to make it home okay? He won't get lost in the field. She shivered. Did you say it was three miles? And it's still snowing. Well, he made it here all right. I suppose if he follows his tracks, he'll make it home. The snow has fallen fast, but not so fast that it would cover them up. As long as he doesn't get stuck. Good point. Well, I'm sure Charlie will stay in touch with him. That's the reason he came over to begin with. Or at least, that's the reason he knew about my ankle. Charlie. He seems like a nice guy. Ashley had turned her back to him again, stirring what was on the stove. He had the boot off his good leg and was gingerly taking it off of his ankle. Maybe he might have overdone it just a little, because his ankle basically screamed in agony as he slipped it out of his boot. That looked like it hurt. It did. He heard the burner snap off, and then Ashley was moving around the table. I never did get to see it. I'm not a nurse or anything, but I'd like to check it out. He honestly didn't mind being babied a little bit. He didn't want to be held back, not when there was work to do, but a gentle touch was something he craved at times. So he leaned his head back, looking at the ceiling, before closing his eyes as her fingers, cool on his heated ankle, pulled his sock down over his foot. Wow, that is... colorful. Colorful is not a very pretty way. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Not a pretty kind of colorful. I really think it's going to be okay. It's a little stiff, 
but it feels better this afternoon than it did this morning. You look like it hurts worse. I think my pain pill is worn off. Let me run out and pack some snow in a bag. You stay on that chair, and you can ice it until supper's ready. You made some kind of soup. She straightened, and he didn't feel abandoned exactly as she left, but definitely felt the loss. Yeah, cheeseburger soup. With some bread. I made some Irish soda bread. I remember that you loved it, and you happen to have all the ingredients, and it's not hard, so I threw it together. I can't believe that you remember that I liked it. How can I forget? You talked a lot more about Ireland back then than you do now. I guess I've fallen in love with North Dakota, but I'll never forget my home. I suppose there will always be a little bit of longing to go back, if only to visit. He didn't want to say that they had talked about visiting together, just one of the many things they talked about, but that one had stuck in his head. Because he had wanted to show Ashley his home country. He wanted her to love it just as much as he did, even if they didn't live there. Well, maybe this Irish soda bread will give you a little taste of home, even if we're snowed in in North Dakota. He smiled, keeping his head leaned back, while she walked out the door for a few minutes, he assumed to fill the bag that she pulled out of the drawer with snow for his leg. He could get used to this. Coming home, having someone to talk to. Someone to care for him, and someone to care about him. But he knew himself, and not just any woman would do. He supposed there were men like that, who just wanted a warm body and didn't care who it was attached to. But for him, he knew he could never imagine anyone but Ashley. He hadn't even tried to date, hadn't had any desire for just any woman. He supposed Ford was right. He had the opportunity. He shouldn't let it pass by. But he didn't know what to do. What more could he do than be himself? The door opened again, and he opened his eyes, turning his head, and sighed watching her walk in. Her nose wasn't shaped quite right, and maybe her eyes were too close together or too far apart, and perhaps her chin wasn't the right angle. He didn't know. But he figured she probably would never grace the cover of a magazine. Still, she was beautiful to him. What's that look for? She asked as she closed the door and stopped her feet on the rug before towing out of her boots. What look? he asked, not wanting to turn his head and look away. If she really was going to leave, and he would only see her for work purposes, it wasn't going to be every day that he would have her in his house, where he could look at her as long as he wanted to. It wasn't a crime to look, was it? You look like you're dreaming, but your eyes are open. That's the look I'm talking about, she said brushing the snow off of her and walking gingerly across the kitchen floor to where he sat, kneeling down by his leg. She grabbed the rag she had put on the table before she walked out, wrapped the bag in it, and laid it carefully on his ankle. He flinched. Hurt? No, just, just touching it's a little sensitive. I'm sorry. Not your fault. Her lips pressed together, but she didn't argue with him. Maybe she'd learned her lesson, that he wasn't going to allow her to try to blame this on herself. If you hold it for just a minute, I'll go get a couple of pain pills from the cupboard and a bottle of water. He was grateful for the store of bottled water that he kept in his pantry. They usually just drank from the tap, and he'd almost forgotten about it. But it had come in handy for sure today. Ford said that he talked to the power company and that there weren't a whole lot of outages so they thought they would be able to get to us fairly quickly tomorrow, as long as they're able to get wherever they need to go in order to fix it. We got a lot of snow, but just north of us, they've gotten even more. That's encouraging, I think. She brought the pills over, setting them in his hand before opening the bottle of water and setting it on the table. She knelt back down at his feet, holding the eyes to his ankle so he could get the water. He took the pills without comment, knowing that they would take the edge off the throbbing in his leg. Maybe he had overdone it just a little, 
but he couldn't sit around while everyone else was working. He just wasn't that kind of man. Not if he was capable of working. I wanted to thank you, she said, after he'd taken a few more gulps of the water and set the bottle on the table. For my gracious hospitality, you're the one who's cooking, and you haven't had a hot shower since you came, so I don't think there's too much for you to thank me for. She smiled. None of that's your fault. I chose to cook, and it's not your fault about the hot water. But no, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, he lifted his brows. What would she be thanking him for? You didn't hold it against me about what I did. He was silent. He had asked her to go to the Christmas barn dance at Cord Strikers, and she had told him yes. The night of the dance, she had called him and told him that she could no longer go with him, but that she would still be at the dance. He had figured something had come up with her gram, that she might be a little late, and he hadn't asked questions. He just said he'd meet her there. It was a little disappointing, but he figured he'd still see her. What she hadn't said was that her dad had brought a man and commanded her to go with his choice to the dance if she was going at all. So she had shown up on the arm of another man. It had been disconcerting to say the least. Painful. Heartbreaking. Because he could hardly run out, crying like a two-year-old. It had been excruciatingly hard to watch for that evening. When he tried to talk to her, she wouldn't. He hadn't understood. The night before, they had been strolling hand in hand in the moonlight. It had been cold, but neither one of them had felt it. The magic of the Christmas season, the beauty of the world around them, the excited hope they had for the future, all of it had been there that night. And then the next day, she was dancing with someone else. He had to find out through the grapevine later that she had gone back to her dad's business. Not long after that, they'd moved her grandmother to a nursing home, and he hadn't seen her again. And now she was thanking him. I couldn't hold it against you, he finally said. It was the truth. You had every right to hold it against me, and yet you've shown me nothing but kindness and compassion and hospitality. Even when I was pretending to not know our history, you didn't throw it in my face. You could have. What good would that have done? I don't know. It might have made you feel better somehow. No, hurting someone else, especially someone I cared so much for, wouldn't make me feel better. Even if she had dealt a blow to his pride, he'd thought she was his girl. They hadn't made any promises to each other, but he hadn't thought they needed to. He certainly wasn't the kind of man who had two women, and he hadn't thought she was the kind of girl who would have two men. That guy you were with, had you been seeing him all along? No. She didn't shout, but her voice was firm. I'm sorry you even had to ask that. No, he wasn't someone I even knew. Dad had brought him and told me that was who he wanted me to be with. If I wanted to continue in the company, if I wanted to have a place in the family, he wasn't going to allow me to throw my life away on you. That's what it would have been. You saw what I've been doing. My life is work. From the time I get up in the morning until the time I go to bed at night. But you have fun. You smile. It isn't a stressful work. It's a work that flows with the seasons. It's a work that is rewarding and enjoyable. It's still taking time to laugh and have fun, to eat together and play checkers. Some days we don't have time to play games. And some days you do. And on the days that you do, you make that time and you do it. He couldn't argue with that. It was true. He was never in a rush, never in a hurry. Not unless there was something going wrong with a berth or if the cows were out and headed toward the road. 
Certain situations dictated essential speed, but for the most part she was right. It was steady work, but not rushed or stressed. It's still work, and you were made for an easier life. One of her hands held the ice to his ankle, the other rested on his other knee. And he picked it up, turned it over, ran a finger across the softness of her palm. You aren't made to do manual labor. You aren't made to be the wife of a farmer. You're made for boardrooms and a life of ease and luxury. No more so than any other woman. You have lady stamped all over you. Lady? Is that an insult? No, it's a compliment. You have class, a way of carrying yourself, a way of speaking. You're different than the people you might rub shoulders with in Sweetwater. I've met those people. I lived here for a year, remember? I'm not different. You are. There's something about you. Well, if we want to go that route, you're different too. You weren't born here. You speak differently. You look different. I've never seen quite that eye color before. The color of the grass in the spring in Ireland. And we told ourselves we were going to go there someday. So she did remember. He smiled at the thought. Smiled that she hadn't forgotten. That it wasn't just him. I can't believe you remember. I'm surprised you do. I don't think I forgot anything. He wanted to point out that he was not the one who left, but he didn't want to hit her while she was down. He didn't want to hit her at all. That was the best year of my life. The best memories. The best everything. I even had fun with Graham. She had been a difficult lady to get along with, but Ashley had charmed her. You were good with her. I might have been. But she loved you. But she was on your dad's side when he came. She was. Ashley sounded like she didn't want to admit that, but she had to be honest. She loved you. She thought you were amazing, but the money thing bothered her too. Sometimes, I think when you grow up with nothing, your mind can get twisted until you think that money is everything, and you make your decisions based on it rather than what God wants. I think that happened to Graham, because I know she knew that you were the better man than anyone Dad could have picked out for me. But she didn't want me to suffer the way she had. I don't think you need to explain that to me. I think I already knew. Maybe not at the time, but I figured it out. That you wouldn't have a life of ease if you were with me, but being with me would be harder. But I would be with a good man. A man who wouldn't leave me. A man who has determination and perseverance. A stubborn man. <laughs> Is there any other kind? <laughs> you know, I think I could say that about you too. Although, I kind of like being this close to you, and I don't want to make you mad. You might move away. I can be closer. She smiled and leaned just a little closer to him and he grinned back at her, bringing his arm up and wrapping it around her. You might not get the job with Ford, then you'll be leaving again. He didn't want to ruin the moment, didn't want to make her move away, but he wasn't a young kid anymore, and he hated to admit it, but he was more cynical than what he had been, a little less willing to be bedazzled and allow the chips to fall where they would. Not to mention, this time, Ellen was liable to get hurt, if Ashley came into his life for just a little while and then slipped out again. That's true. I might not get the job, but I don't know that I'll be leaving. There's no work for you in Sweetwater if Ford doesn't hire you. There's a diner. I can be a waitress. That's a hard job. Maybe he's hiring field hands. I could be one of the people you're going to supervise. I wouldn't want to be your boss. I think you'd make a good boss. I'd be happy to work under you. The buzzer on the stove rang, and while Tig was disappointed, he was also a little relieved. 
he was falling for her again. Not just his feelings, but she pulled at his soul like no one else ever had, and that hadn't changed in the years they'd been apart. He had a feeling if she left again, it was going to hurt just as bad as, and more likely worse than, it had the first time. Chapter 14 Put God first, then spouse, and let your spouse feel cherished. Elaine Huff, Colbert, Georgia Ashley ran to get the Irish soda bread out. She had remembered from years ago that it was one of Tig's favorites. She liked it herself, and would never have known about it if Tig hadn't introduced it to her. Do you feel well enough to eat? Would you like me to bring it in? She thought for a bit that whatever had been between them before had come back even more. She could be wrong, but she thought the look on Tig's face when the buzzer on the stove rang was relief. That hurt, that he'd only been pretending to enjoy their time together and was happy to be interrupted. Unless he is afraid to get close to you again. Oh, I can come. If I sit in one place too long, I'll get stiff. She looked over at him but didn't say anything. Maybe he was afraid of being burned again. That was legitimate. She hadn't treated him well. And while he didn't seem to hold it against her, he also didn't seem eager to get close to her. Rightfully so. She herself didn't know if she were staying, and trying to have a long-distance relationship would never work most especially because Tig was never going to leave Sweetwater. If he crossed an ocean to follow the racehorse that he loved, then he certainly wasn't going to leave Sweetwater to follow her when his racehorse was still here. Was it a terrible thing for a woman to be jealous of a racehorse? Where are you smiling? He asked as he hobbled to the cupboard and got two plates out. Sometimes women don't make any sense. She didn't know what else to say. Well, I don't have much experience with women, but I can agree that mares make less sense than geldings. They get upset and it's hard to figure out why. Ashley allowed her small smile to get bigger. She supposed that was probably true of women, although when she could feel herself get moody, she tried hard to not allow her feelings to take over her actions. She had searched and searched, but she couldn't find any excuse for PMS, hormonal imbalances, or any of the other things that she liked to blame her bad moods on in the Bible. What she did find in the Bible were commands to act a certain way and commands to control her thoughts. She figured God wouldn't command her to do something it wasn't possible to do. She did, however, figure it would be hard. So maybe I haven't been around women enough, but I'm not sure what I said that made you almost laugh. Tig spoke carefully, like he wasn't sure whether he was going to make her mad with his comments or not. I don't think you need to walk around on tenterhooks with me. She glanced over at him as she pulled a knife out of the drawer to cut the soda bread. I love Alan, but sometimes I say something. And it sets her off, and I'm not even sure what I said. I just was trying to be careful that it didn't happen with you. Ashley laughed and nodded. I think teen girls are known for being drama queens, but our emotions and feelings are just something we have to learn to control. She's young yet. Give her some time to work through her issues, and hopefully she'll realize that everyone, including herself, is happier if she doesn't fly off the handle over every little thing. That's a good thing to learn, but you still didn't tell me what made you smile. The clank of the fork being set on the table broke the silence as Ashley thought about what he said. Why not? She could talk to him about this. Maybe it wasn't something she would normally talk to someone she hadn't seen for more than a decade, but they were snowed in together, alone, and it might not be a good conversation exactly, but he had asked. I was laughing because so often as women we blame the way we act on the way we feel, whether it's PMS or hormones, or we just feel like it. 
and we think that's a good excuse. I was just thinking to myself that I don't see that in the Bible. I don't see God saying, be kind, unless you're dealing with PMS. Then it's okay to lash out. But whatever, you know. She looked over her shoulder and wasn't exactly shocked to find that Tig seemed to be blushing. His face was pointed down at the table as his hand fingered the fork he had just set down. I embarrassed you, didn't I? No, not really. I do a lot of stuff with animals, and whether it's breeding or birthing or even a moody mare, I'm not afraid to talk about it. It's a natural cycle of life. I guess the thing that got me is I don't think I've ever heard a woman say that her feelings weren't a good reason for the way she acted. You just surprised me, that's all. You said yourself you're not around women that much. I'm not as much of an anomaly as you might think. Maybe, but you also took your argument from the Bible. That's not something I typically hear from anyone, male or female. I, I guess I was a little convicted, because isn't that what we're all supposed to do? We're not supposed to just say I felt like it, or I'm pretty sure this is right, or this is what all the pop psychologists say, or this is what I saw in a sitcom. Or even that's what we were taught in school. It doesn't matter. If it disagrees with the Bible, or if the Bible doesn't teach it, then it's wrong. Ashley had given the soup one last stir, then her hand froze even though she didn't turn around. She thought he'd just given her a compliment. Picking up the soup, she turned around, searching immediately for Tig's face, just to see his expression. Maybe he hadn't meant it the way she'd taken it. Hey, let me get you a hot pad for that. He hobbled around the table, reaching behind her to open a drawer. Tig shuffled to the table, setting it down. There you go. Sorry, guess I was thinking that what you just said sounded like a compliment. I, I didn't know what to say, and I wanted to see if you meant it. It was a compliment, and I definitely meant it. His voice dropped a little on that last sentence as she straightened from setting the soup down. He didn't move, and there were just a few inches separating them. The pull she had always felt was even stronger the closer he got. Normally, there was humor twinkling in his green eyes, but there seemed to be something else there. Not a twinkle, but a slow burn. She found her breath was shaky and her hands trembled. Tig had always had that effect on her, and to find that he admired her, or at least admired the way she thought, had done nothing to slow the feeling. But she had just lectured him that a person could control their feelings and didn't have to act on them. What if she wanted to? The thought made her mouth go dry. Several slow heartbeats crawled by as they stared at each other. Tig moved, just a shift of his weight, and his hand started to come up. Maybe he was going to touch her face with it. Maybe he was shifting closer. But his face crinkled and tightened with pain. Whatever spell had been wrapping around them dissipated immediately as she touched his shoulder, more out of concern than out of some irresistible pull. Are you okay? Yeah, just shifted my ankle in the wrong direction, and man, that hurt. It had been feeling better, too. I'm sorry. Why don't you sit down? I just have to put the soda bread on the table, even though it's more like dessert than a bread we'd eat with the meal. <laughs> I love soda bread, Tig muttered, taking a look at her before seemingly reluctantly moving toward the table. I know, she said softly. His head jerked toward her, and he froze halfway to his seat. Then he lowered himself slowly. I made it because I knew you loved it. You remembered? <laughs> of course. How could I forget us sneaking into Graham's kitchen at two o'clock in the morning because you insisted that I just had to learn how to make this wonderful bread that was all Irish, and you were going to show me how to be a true Irish woman? I might have been feeding you a bit of a line. You think so? She asked giving her head a saucy toss. She had known that he had been joking, but it was what he said. 
Maybe I just wanted to spend time with you. Maybe you were just the most interesting woman I've ever met. Maybe I was grasping at anything I could try to get you to notice me and want to be with me. Ashley swallowed. His words had been said slowly, almost like he was reluctantly admitting that the soda bread had been a ruse. It had been all about her, about wanting to be with her. Are you telling me that you don't like soda bread? She finally asked, and there might have been a little bit of humor in her voice, because she just found that so unbelievable that he would go to that kind of length just to be with her. I like soda bread, but I like the company far better. She nodded, knowing that was a big step for him. After what she'd done, after the way she'd left, that he was willing to even say that much, to be that vulnerable, trusting that she wouldn't do what she had already done a second time, was humbling. They ate the soup and the soda bread and did the dishes together. The conversation was easy, although there was an underlying current that felt anticipatory to Ashley. She wasn't exactly sure what she was anticipating, and she wasn't sure whether she should walk forward or put distance between them, mostly because she didn't want to hurt him again. She didn't trust herself. She hadn't told her parents that she was leaving the company, and if she didn't get the job with Fort Hansen, Tig was right. There wasn't anything for her in Sweetwater. Since he couldn't leave, and she certainly wouldn't ask him to, the only solution was for her to stay. And without a job, she couldn't. Not to mention, her parents might beg her to stay with the company, and as much as she thought she wasn't going to, she had never liked letting them down. Yeah, it was her that she didn't trust. By the time they were done eating and the dishes were washed, it was still too early to go to bed, and of course the shower still wasn't working, which probably bothered Ashley more than anything else. But there was nothing they could do about it, and she wasn't going to get upset. You probably ought to sit down somewhere and put your foot up. I was thinking about sitting on the couch and propping it up, but I wanted to do it in such a way that you can sit there too. Ashley looked at the couch. It was a regular-sized couch, and there would be plenty of room if she sat on one end and he sat on the other for his leg to be between them. I think we'll fit. She walked over to the couch, picking up the blanket. There was just one. I think this is going to be the problem. In what way? Tig asked, his brows furrowing as he looked at the blanket, then back to her. Maybe not. I can't imagine sitting on the couch without snuggling in a blanket, and I thought it might not be big enough for us to share. He opened his mouth, as though he were going to say it didn't matter. He didn't snuggle under blankets, which she was just guessing from the look on his face. But then his mouth snapped shut, and he got a look in his eyes she couldn't really read. Boy, I guess that is a problem. I don't know what we can do about that, because I know the blanket isn't big enough for you to be on one end of the couch and me on the other. I feel like maybe this is like the whole Irish soda bread thing. What? You know, I can't be a true Irish woman friend to my Irish friends if I've never tried soda bread, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm feeding you a bunch of blarney. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I guess I don't really want you on one end of the couch and me on the other. There. Is that better? His words made her breath catch. Maybe it was better if he didn't say it so clearly. Better to beat around the bush and not come straight out and say things she wasn't sure she was ready to handle yet. But as she was standing there, a thousand thoughts ran through her head. But the one that really stuck out to her was that God had put them together, had them snowed in for a reason. What were the odds that she would have stopped at the end of his driveway? Even greater were the odds that he would be on his way to the mailbox at the same time she had her accident. 
She couldn't even imagine what the odds of those two things happening at the same time were. And yet, here they were, together with a second chance. Maybe God was giving her an opportunity to redo, to fix the mistakes she made all those years ago when she walked away from Tyg, when she hurt him. It was inconceivable to her that he had forgiven her for that, that he wasn't holding anything against her. That was on her mind as they sat down, she on the end of the couch, he right beside her, with his leg up on the coffee table. Somehow he managed to get his arm around her, and she wasn't quite sure how it happened, but she liked the way she fit in next to him. He felt comfortable and right. They didn't say anything for a bit, just let the silence fall around them. They'd left the candle burning on the table, and it cast a flickering, warm, orange glow over the entire room. The snow had stopped falling, and the moon glistened on the snow outside the window. I always wanted you closer, but I never knew how to say that. Tyg's words were soft, and she could feel his lips moving against her hair. I wish you would have. I wanted that too. But I always thought you just wanted to be friends. Do friends get up at two o'clock in the morning to make Irish soda bread in their friend's grandmother's kitchen? Sure. That's something I would have done with my girlfriends. I don't have another friend in the world that I would have done that with. I suppose it didn't say what I thought it said, if you didn't understand. I suppose I hoped I knew what it said, but maybe I needed the words because I didn't want to misread anything. I don't know that I've gotten much better at saying the words since then. And I probably haven't gotten any better at reading between the lines. We're a pair. I suppose, although I can't get over the fact that you don't seem to be holding it against me that I just left and the way I left. If it had been me, if I had left, and I might have... No, you wouldn't have. Well, hear me out. I followed Sunday across the ocean. If someone would have told me the night of the dance that Sunday was leaving, say Ford had sold him, I think I would have left. I'm not sure I would have stayed. But you wouldn't have gone to the dance with someone else. If someone would have said I had to go to the dance with someone else in order to save Sunday, I would have done it, I think. She sat in silence for a bit, absorbing this new information. She hadn't realized he was thinking about it like that. I know, I probably shouldn't have admitted it. I should have let you feel guilty, like you had done something that I would never do but I've always tried to put myself in someone else's position. I'm not always great at it, but sometimes I look at someone and I think, oh, I could never do that. You know, like a serial killer. I could never do that. I know you wouldn't. You're way too gentle to be a killer. But I don't know about their upbringing. I don't know how they were raised. Maybe they had an abusive father, an alcoholic mother. Maybe they had some kind of traumatic experience. I don't know, but I don't think I can judge them, saying that I would never do what they did. Maybe, maybe there are circumstances that would make me do pretty much anything. His fingers ran along her upper arm absentmindedly, almost as though he were thinking and not really paying attention to what he was doing. I guess it's that quote, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, I think that's so true. God's grace is the only reason I'm not a serial killer, that I wasn't the one who left you at the party, that I wasn't the one who broke your heart, that I'm not worse than what I am today. God gave me grace. How can I judge you when I could have been just as bad if not worse? Well, she didn't know what else to say. Wasn't it human nature to look at someone else and think how they were worse than a person considered themselves to be? That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to point fingers and say she would never do what her sister had done. But would she have? 
if it had been her who struggled with academics, if it had been her who never seemed to please her parents, if nothing she had done had ever been right, if her little sister had one-upped her every time, if she had seen the opportunity to beat her little sister for once, to look good in her parents' eyes, to finally get ahead, would she have taken it? Chapter 15 So many things. Base your marriage on faith in God. Stand by your vows. Love is a choice, not just a feeling. Choose love, even in the hard times, and there will be hard times. Remember, no one is perfect, even you. Learn to forgive quickly. We've been married 60 years next week. Judy Huffman, from Southeast Ohio. Ashley wanted to say no, but with Tig's admission, she had to look at herself realistically. She hadn't had the same upbringing that her sister had had, even though they'd grown up in the same home. They hadn't been given the same talents and abilities. Their parents hadn't treated them the same. She couldn't say for sure that she wouldn't have turned out exactly the way her sister had if she had been given the exact same treatment that Tracy had. I've never thought of it like that before. I... I appreciate you saying something. There are a few things I've done that I think now might be wrong. Don't give yourself a hard time. Isn't that what life is? Learning. We figure things out as we go. We wouldn't need to live a life for 70 or 80 years if we were all born knowing everything from the get-go. But God gives us information a little bit at a time. He allows us to discover things, for truth to be uncovered, and then he watches to see what we're going to do with it. Do we apply it to our lives? Or do we ignore it because it might require some change in us and we're not willing to give that up? Not move out of our comfortable life just because it might please God a little better. This was part of what she loved about him. Even when they knew each other long ago, he was always thinking about things, trying to do right, encouraging her to do right, making her better. That was the kind of man she wanted to be with, someone who made her better, and not just in a spiritual way. He took her out of her comfort zone. Look at her living on a farm, living without electricity, cozy in a cabin, in North Dakota of all places. He made her want to be a better human, too. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt you again, she blurted out. That was her big concern. She loved being next to him, loved being snuggled up to him loved how he made her feel, and not just in a romantic way, but in an encouraged, I-can-be-better way. But she couldn't be selfish. She couldn't move forward with him when she could end up hurting him. Wouldn't that be something I'm supposed to worry about? I guess, but if I care about you, I care whether or not I hurt you. I care whether or not the things I say, the things I do, whether they build you up or tear you down, whether they cause you to smile or cause you to grit your teeth and look away, to hurt your heart. I don't want to do that, because I do care about you. She emphasized the word care just a little. She wanted to say love. She did love him the kind of love where she wanted to do more for him than he did for her, where she wanted to make sure he was okay, to protect him, to be the one who provided companionship and joy and laughter in his life. That's what she wanted. All right, that's a good point. I guess I feel that way about you too. But in my mind, I'm thinking that I would do whatever it takes to not hurt you. And I feel like it's worth it to take the chance that it might be a painful experience for me. I survived the last time. I think I'll survive again. 
and I suppose whatever time I get, I feel like it'll be worth it. No, I don't want you to just take whatever's left. I want you to have everything. I want you to have the best. Then give it to me. You said yourself, if Ford doesn't hire me, what can I do here? I mean, I know I said I was going to be a waitress, but... Waitressing is a hard job, and I'm not knocking it, but you were made for more. I feel like that's true. I'm not sure I would be happy being a waitress. Did it matter? Would she be happy if she were away from Tyg? Would she rather be a waitress and be with Tyg than the head of her father's company and be without him? She was pretty sure she knew the answer to that question. She was also pretty sure that Tyg was the kind of man who was worth giving up whatever it took to be with him. Some men would take advantage of her and not appreciate what she was giving him. But Tyg wasn't that kind of man. She was almost positive that whatever she gave up, she would be getting far more, and she would never regret it. What she would regret, however, she knew from experience, was hurting Tyg. And I don't want you to do something that you wouldn't be happy doing. Tyg seemed to have no clue of the directions her thoughts were taking, and it took her a minute to realize he was responding to her last comment, where she said she wasn't sure she would be happy being a waitress. You know what? I would be happy being a waitress. I don't think what I do is as important as who I love and who loves me. A vocation is something that I can decide to be happy in. But finding someone who will be honest and upright, who will make me a better person, who will make me smile every day and laugh. She looked over her shoulder at him, meeting his twinkling eyes. She knew he would be smiling. There had been very few times when they had been together that he hadn't been happy. In fact, she could only remember one. The last day she saw him. Who will be loyal and determined, kind and considerate? Well, I'm not sure when you switched from talking about me to talking about you, but you don't have to convince me. I'm already sold. She laughed. <laughs> the thing is, I would never forgive myself if I hurt you again. I thought we agreed that it was up to me to make that decision. But I'm the one who has to not do it, and I'm not sure I can. Then let's just go on, assuming that you can. And if you can't, we'll deal with that at the time. She wanted to agree, but part of her just wasn't confident enough in herself to say yes. Ashley, I'm a man. I'm thirty years old. I promise you, I know what I want, and I can handle whatever God gives me. You might think you're in charge, but I know who really is in charge, and I'm not afraid. Don't you be afraid either. She realized he was right. She was afraid. Afraid of hurting him. Okay. So let's just be friends and go from there. That's not exactly what I was thinking, but it will work. Friends with an eye toward more. Okay, sure. Friends with an eye toward more. Friends that kiss each other goodnight. She laughed. <laughs> okay, maybe eventually we'll be friends who kiss each other goodnight. Fine, eventually. I can work with that. By the end of the evening is eventually, right? She loved that he could make her laugh, that he was pursuing her, didn't want her to get away, was showing her how much he wanted her, that he wasn't afraid of any pain she might cause him, because he felt like she was worth it. They sat for a while, chatting about things they had done when they were younger, laughing at how young and innocent they were. Tyg seemed very interested in everything that Ashley did for her parents' company, and she had to admit she enjoyed talking to him about it. It was always fun to talk to someone who seemed to be interested in what a person was saying. 
He told her stories of Ireland and of growing up and of his parents and his sister. And she finally asked him something that she had wondered about for a long time. You never talk about how you got Ellen. You always call her your niece, but I don't understand why you're raising her. By this time, her hand was on his leg, and he reached over, covering it with his. He threaded their fingers together, and she loved the way it felt. So much that she almost forgot that he was answering a question until he spoke, breaking the silence that had fallen. I had a twin brother. Todd. We did everything together. Except he fell in love with a woman while I fell in love with a horse. We were grooms at the same stable, but I guess no one could compare to Sunday for me. He grinned a little self-effacingly, and then he squeezed her hand. Until you. I hope you never have to choose between me and your horse. He laughed, like he wasn't the slightest bit worried about it. I know you took me to see him pretty much every week back in the day, but I wouldn't mind going again. Oh, trust me, I wanted you to see him yesterday, but not everyone understands the deep attachment I have toward him. Well, I saw it. I knew how you felt. There's just a special bond between you two. Yeah, well, Todd was good with horses, but he wasn't quite like me. I was more quiet. He was better with the ladies. Okay, a lot of times twins are like that, where one has a more outgoing personality. Yeah, Todd was kind of our spokesperson between the two of us. Anyway, he got married, they had Ellen, and they were in a car crash and both of them died. He said the story quickly, without giving details, although Ashley felt like she didn't need them. It still sounded painful, having a twin, growing up doing everything with them, and then losing them suddenly and unexpectedly had to break his heart, and it probably still hurt. And so you took Ellen. My brother survived the crash. I guess I should have been more specific. He wasn't in good shape, though. He begged the first responders to make sure that I knew he wanted me to take Ellen. I hated that he knew he was going to die. That's hard. Did he know that his wife had already not made it? He must have. That's probably why he was asking for me to take Ellen. Then maybe he didn't want to survive. That's painful, too. Of course it would have been the fact that he would have wanted to be with his wife rather than his twin. Although it shouldn't have been surprising. A man left his family to start a new family with his wife. He should choose her over anything he'd left behind, or there was something wrong. Tig's hand squeezed hers again. You know, that always hurt, that he wanted to be with his wife, that he knew he was going to die and I felt like he didn't even try to save himself, to try to live. He was just taking care of Ellen so he could follow his wife. Well, I guess I kind of understand that. I did all those years ago when we were together before. I, I know this sounds stupid, but I guess when you left, I wanted to follow, and I can understand how a man wouldn't want to be separated. He shook his head. I'm saying that badly. I understand what you mean. That is kind of like you were saying before. You don't really understand what causes someone to do what they did. When you judge them, you're not taking into account that you might have done the exact same thing if you had lived the life that they had lived. Yeah, something like that. Ashley was glad she had asked, satisfied with the answer. She hated to think that Ellen had been abandoned or unwanted. I'm sorry I brought up painful memories. I can't believe we haven't talked about it before. I was always afraid to ask. It was the one subject that seemed to be the elephant in the room, you know? Something everyone's always curious about and you don't touch it. Yeah, 
But not because I'm ashamed of Ellen or because of anything terrible. Just, it still hurts to talk about Todd, even though it's been twelve years. She must have been tiny. Yeah, still in the car carrier, just two or three months old. That was quite a shock for you. It wasn't at first. Mom took care of her while I was at work, and my sister still lived at home, so we all kind of took care of her in the evening and on weekends. I lived for my horse, so it wasn't like she interrupted any of my dating life. And it all would have been good if Sunday hadn't been sold to the United States. You always said you loved Ireland, but you'd never go back. Ireland will always have a piece of my heart, but I've settled in North Dakota, and I love her. When you love something, you latch onto it and never let go. That's not entirely true. I latch on to it, but sometimes love means allowing whatever it is that you love to walk away. Ashley didn't say anything, because he was talking about her, and she could see it easily. She thought she even knew it back at the time, that he wasn't going to fight to keep her, not when he thought that she was better off without him anyway. It was almost midnight, and Ashley had yawned for the fourth time when Tig said, I think it's time for you to go to bed. I think you're right. I'm going to end up sleeping here, and it's going to be pretty uncomfortable for you to not be able to move. I wouldn't mind, but you'll get a better night's sleep if you go to bed. Plus, I don't want to wake you up when I go out in the morning. I'd like to go with you. You don't want to get up and go out in the cold and dark. Well, I'll take you out later, once the sun comes up. She wanted to argue, but she knew he was right. She really didn't want to get up in the dark and go outside in the cold. Maybe the lights will come back on tomorrow. I'm betting on it. I sure hope so. I wouldn't mind taking a shower. I'll see you in the morning, Tig said as she stood up, and he stood up behind her. Their hands were still clasped, and he lifted hers to his lips and touched her knuckles with them. I think eventually is not tonight, he murmured. She nodded, but in her heart, she kind of wished it were. Chapter 16 Do not be unequally yoked. Light can't mix with dark. Be God-centered. God always first. Communication Commitment, loyalty, listening to each other's viewpoints, and settling disagreements before going to bed. Ruth Carter, Warrington, Virginia Tig hummed as he forked hay in the morning. He had been thinking a lot about the Bible verse saying how all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Even though it had been painful all those years ago to see Ashley walk away, he knew that they were young. It might not have worked out. It had probably been for the best for both of them to give themselves ten years to grow up. He could see that she had changed, and so had he. He was pretty sure she wasn't going to let her parents dictate what she did, and he wasn't going to follow Sunday if, for any reason, Ford decided to sell him. Definitely the years had matured them, and he could see that they were more fit for each other now than they had been then. Are you humming? The voice from the doorway wasn't exactly a shock, but Tig still stopped what he was doing and turned around. Travis, where have you been? He grinned as he said it so Travis would know that he didn't actually expect him to come across the field in the blinding snow. Mom's been stuck in town during the blizzard, so I've been by myself with Roger and Edgar. I couldn't have come while it was still snowing in case something would have happened to me in the blizzard. I didn't want them to be stuck there by themselves with no electricity for who knows how long. Of course, I was messing with you. I wouldn't have wanted to go across the field and find your frozen body halfway to Canada. You're a smart kid for staying home. I figured that's what you'd say. Travis was always too serious for his own good. He didn't have much of a home life, 
His mom preferred hanging out at the bar to hanging out with her kids. And that probably had something to do with the fact that his dad was a long-distance truck driver and was gone more than he was home. Which was probably a good thing, since when he was home, he was usually in a rage if he wasn't passed out drunk. I'm glad to see you today, though. Where are the boots I bought you? He looked at the ratty old things on Travis's feet. Tig didn't make a whole lot, but he didn't need to spend a whole lot either. The boots had been expensive, but Travis had needed them. My brother wanted to go outside and play, and his boots were worse off than mine, so I gave up my good ones and figured it wouldn't matter much, since I wouldn't really want to wear them the whole way over here in two feet of snow anyway. Tig didn't roll his eyes, but he kind of wanted to. The amount of snow they had and the amount of walking Travis had to do had nothing to do with the fact that he hadn't wanted to see his brother's feet get frostbite from playing outside. Does he wear the same size as you? Basically, his feet are a little smaller, but they're growing. Tig made a note to order the same size and the exact same pair that he'd gotten Travis. What about the little guy, Edgar? He's got a pair. I guess he's at that spurt where I grew so fast I didn't wear out the boots that you bought me before I outgrew them. He's wearing those boots. All right. He didn't need to tell Travis he was going to be buying Roger a pair of boots. Or, more likely, buying Travis a pair of boots because, unless he missed his guess, Travis had probably given his boots to Roger and not just let him borrow them. They worked in silence for a bit before Travis said, are you going to tell me why you were humming this morning? And you keep smiling. It's weird. I'm usually pretty happy. Well, you don't usually yell at me, but you don't usually spend all your time humming. And what is that song? You are my sunshine? He sang a few lines. Mm, would you stop? It should be illegal to be this happy before the sun comes up. Good thing you aren't married. Your wife would kick you out of bed in the morning just to get your smiling face away from her. Smiling faces are good, especially in the morning. And where are you getting all this bah humbug stuff? Wives like happy husbands. You should practice. Travis didn't say anything, but he looked thoughtful. Tig didn't push. He kind of had an idea, after going to some of the football games the past fall, that Travis had his eye on a certain cheerleader. Travis had wanted to go out for football, and Tig had made sure he made practices and games, since his own parents couldn't be depended on. Thing was, the cheerleader was a year older than Travis, and Tig was pretty sure she didn't know Travis was alive. Those were the hardest crushes to have, the ones on people who were so far out of your league that there was just no hope of you ever being what she wanted. But maybe that was for the best because from what Tig could tell, the cheerleader didn't have much character. All the cheerleader's assets had gone to her looks, and she was sadly lacking in morals and values. He'd been trying to gently teach Travis that while a man had a tendency to look at a woman and want one that looked good, he was far better off looking beyond the surface, into her heart. It was a lesson that was sometimes hard for them to learn, harder for some men than others. Why are you limping around? Tig laughed and told him what happened. See, I told you you should let me drive the tractor. I didn't get hurt while driving. It was after cleaning off the windshield. And I'll happily let you do that. You're like a monkey. Same way I used to be when I was young and agile. Too skinny for my own good. You mean strong and handsome, with youthful vigor that has greatly faded with your age. Right, you little whippersnapper. They joked, laughing a little. Then Tig pressed him about school, and they talked about the Christmas pageant, which Tig had roped Travis into helping him with. After all, Tig was picking up Travis's two younger brothers and taking them to practice, so he had told Travis that he might as well come along and give him a hand. Travis had felt important, like he'd been given an adult-sized job, and Tig appreciated that he didn't mind going to church. 
They made a good team, too, since Travis had always been good with kids, probably because he practically raised his younger brothers himself. You're coming in for breakfast, Tig asked as they finished up the watering out of the barrels that Charlie had put out the night before. Charlie would be down later and get more water to melt, but with his old joints, he didn't get up as early as he used to. Sure, my brothers won't be up for a while. They're pretty excited that we got so much snow, and they haven't gotten tired of playing in it yet. We're definitely not going to school today. Not today, but maybe tomorrow. I'm counting on the electricity coming on today, though. Tig put a hand on Travis's back as they put their pitchforks up and glanced around the dim tack room one more time before they walked out the door and toward the house. I don't know if you know or not, but there was a lady that had a car accident by my lane. She's staying with me, just in case she's up or comes out sometime while we're eating. A lady? Travis lifted his brows. He was serious, but not so serious that he couldn't tease Tig once in a while. Ashley, she's someone I knew a long time ago. Knew? So this is an old girlfriend, and she just happened to have an accident at the end of your lane? Don't you find that funny? She wasn't an old girlfriend, just a friend. And Tig shook his head. I do, but I don't think it's because she did it on purpose. It was during the blizzard, and she had no idea where she was. If there was anyone doing any kind of funny business with that, it was the Lord. So you can take it up with him. Maybe he's tired of you being all alone and lonely and grumpy all the time, and he's giving you that woman who's going to kick you out of bed for being too happy in the morning. <laughs> no, Ashley is not going to kick me out of bed in the morning. She's going to be snuggling, and I'm going to have to drag myself out of bed. He had no idea whether or not that would actually be true, but a man could dream. I knew it. She's more than a friend. Travis pointed his finger, poking it in Tig's chest, and Tig grinned, abashed. He'd fallen right into that trap, nice and neat. We're friends, with the potential to be more, I think is what she said. It felt weird saying that to a teenager, but sometimes Travis seemed well older than his 16 years. All right, I got it. I need to be on my best behavior, because this is the woman who's going to be with you for the next hundred years. I don't think I have a hundred years left in me. Although, the idea of spending a hundred years with Ashley did not sound too bad. In fact, he wished he could. On that thought, he opened the door, smelling bacon right away and seeing Ashley standing at the stove, her back toward them. He allowed Travis to walk in first, and by the time he had the door shut, Ashley had turned around. Her eyes landed on Travis, and she smiled. I'm Ashley, she said. This is Travis. I found him wandering around outside, made him do a little work, and I figured I'd feed him before I sent him home. I can help you with the feeding part anyway. I wondered what I was going to do with all this bacon, and I cracked more eggs than both of us could eat together, so it's a good thing you found someone to help you clean this food up. He wanted to go over and kiss her, wrap his arms around her and tell her how much he appreciated her. He didn't know whether she had actually made extra or not, but he was guessing not. But she made Travis feel like he was actually doing them a favor by coming in and eating, which Travis kind of needed because he was used to being told that he was in the way and a burden. Ashley had a way of making Travis feel right at home. She put him to work, told him to set the table. Then she asked him how he wanted his eggs right after she asked Tig, treating them the same. Tig appreciated her treatment of his friend. By the time they were done, and Travis had gotten warm by the fire, he stood to leave. Thanks a lot for the breakfast, ma'am. I'll feed you any time. Actually, you have to thank Tig, because all the food was his. She's put a big dent in my groceries. It's a good thing I was stocked up. They needed to be cooked anyway. The bacon was in the freezer, and it was thawed out. Hopefully the lights come back on today. 
Ashley nodded, and Tig looked at Travis. Are you guys eating okay? I can cook, and we're good for another day at least. The boys would probably like it to be longer, because both of them are pretty happy they don't have to take showers. Ashley was pretty happy about that too. I don't know what I'm going to do with her. Really? Ashley tilted her head, giving him a look, but it was ruined by the twitching of her lips. I might have to throw her in there and scrub her down, clothes and all. You just try that, she said, humor and threat melding together in her voice. I'm not sure I should leave you two alone. I think she can handle you, big boy, Travis said, tapping Tig on the head as he walked by his chair. I'll roll you around in the snow a few times. Sounds like you need it, kid. I know. I'm stronger than you are, but you weigh more than I do, and you'll use that to your advantage. Tig wasn't looking, but he kind of figured Travis probably stuck his tongue out before he walked out the door. It was what he would have done when he was 16. He seems like a nice kid. He hangs around? Ashley asked after he had left. Yeah. His mom was stranded at a bar during the snowstorm. As far as Travis knows, she's still there. The one cell phone they have is dead, and they haven't heard from her since she called and said that she wouldn't be home. He has siblings. Two little brothers. They're in the Christmas pageant, and Travis is going to help me. I'll pick him up when I pick them up. I see. A dad? Seldom home. It would be better if he wasn't. As they spoke, lights came on overhead, causing them both to look up. They went back out, then came on and stayed on. I'm going to get a hot shower, Ashley said, a smile stretching across her face. Wow, that really means a lot to you. You have no idea. She lifted her brows, and while there was humor on her face, he could tell she was absolutely serious. How long do you think it'll take the water to get hot? I'd give it at least an hour. Do I get to shower first? I'm pretty sure that it would be dangerous for me to get between you and your hot shower. So, yes, you take one first. No, I couldn't do that. It's your house. You take the first hot shower. No, really, I insist that you need to do it. Okay, if you insist. You capitulated way too easily. I did, didn't I? She bit her lip. Do I really need to argue with you some more about it? No, you don't. I'm happy that you want to be clean. Really, I'd be a little worried if you didn't care. Good. He let her take a hot shower first. He wanted her to. And he loved the idea of having someone in his house that he could banter with, smile with and discuss serious topics, like Travis and his family. It was probably a good thing the lights had come back on. He was getting way too used to having Ashley in his house. Chapter 17 Friendship with Lots of Humor Sheila Bryant, South Carolina I called Jeb's towing in town, and he said he'd be out later today to get your car. Oh. Ashley knew she should be happy about that, but it meant that her time with Tig was drawing to a close. That shouldn't make her as unhappy as it did. I told him to take it to his shop and give you an estimate on the damages. If you have something else you wanted to do, I can call him any time before noon and change it. No, that's fine. She took a breath. Life moved on. It always did. A person couldn't get stuck in any situation, good or bad. She had to remember that. Are you still going to be able to take me over to Ford's place? Charlene had called just a few minutes after the lights came on, like she sensed the change somehow. She told Ashley that Ford could meet with her and that Tig should be able to take her across the way and attract her. Tig hadn't had a problem agreeing. I'm ready if you are. Tig seemed just the same as he'd been the whole time. She was the only one who was sad to see their time together end. 
I am. She infused as much cheerfulness into her voice as she could, refusing to allow her thoughts to get her down. If you don't mind, I have a cow that I've been keeping an eye on. She's ready to drop her calf any time. I can't believe she didn't do it during the storm. Do cows have a tendency to do that? Have their babies during bad weather? It seems weird, but they really do. I always thought it was because their instinct tells them that they're less likely to be bothered by predators. I don't know if that's true, or if it's the calves born in storms that are the most memorable, so it seems like there are more of them. Hmm, that's a good theory anyway. Thanks. I'd say I thought of it all by myself, but I probably read it somewhere at some point. They laughed together as Tig opened the door and they stepped out into the blinding white brightness. So much white. Ashley wasn't sure she'd ever seen such bright white before. Here. Tig bumped her arm, handing her a pair of sunglasses. I should have warned you about the snow. When it stops and the sun comes out, it's almost impossible to see. Thanks. Maybe it's really cold, but it doesn't feel like it. It's cold. Single digits, but there's no wind, and the humidity is low. That makes it feel warmer. No wind? Is there such a thing in North Dakota? She asked, grateful that he had plowed a path from the house to the barn when he'd been out earlier. She was dressed for the weather, not for meeting with a potential client, but she didn't want to arrive soaking wet if she could help it. And, thanks to Tig, she could. Sometimes after a storm the wind blows for what feels like days, and maybe it will kick in. But we also get this crazy calm sometimes, too. I'm not sure which one I like better. You mean you're not sure which one you like least? Neither one of them sounded good to her. No, I said it right. I love both. Love everything North Dakota gives me. She reminds me of Ireland in a way. Really? Ashley wouldn't have said they had anything in common. Sure, there's something a little mysterious about her. She's always giving you something to keep you off guard, always changing. Sometimes she doesn't seem very lovable, but when you love something, you love all of it, all the time. At least, I do. He shrugged, like it wasn't a big deal. But Ashley almost stopped, his words were so true. For Tig, he loved with his whole soul forever and ever. Look how he'd followed Sunday across the ocean, how he'd kept his niece when it would have been easier to let her go, how he talked about the land like it was a living thing, and how even a snowstorm and sub-freezing temperatures didn't seem bad to him. He would do that for you. Ashley tried to shove the voice aside as Tig broke off the path pushing the snow aside with his feet so she wouldn't have as much to step in as she came along behind him. But she knew the voice was right. He would stay with her, think the best of her, love her, forever, if she allowed him to. It might not even be a matter of her allowing him. He might do it anyway. Hey, she's having it now. Tig's voice was soft as he glanced around. They'd walked around the shed and he pointed to a cow not far from the fence. See the feet sticking out. It took a bit, but she could make them out. Two little white pointy hooves behind a shaggy reddish coat. The mama cow looked over at them as though asking why they were invading her privacy. Tig didn't move. His voice, when he spoke, was low. It's usually not long before the rest of the calf comes out after you can see the feet. Mind if we wait for a few minutes? Sure, I've never seen a calf be born. Birth is a miracle, each and every time. His voice held wonder and a little awe. The cow's sides seemed to heave and the feet inched outward. Ashley wanted to point and tell Tig that it was coming but she clamped her mouth closed. He was being very still and quiet, and she imitated his actions as much as she wanted to talk about what was happening. He was right. It was less than ten minutes later, long enough for her toes to feel like they were slowly freezing inside her boots, when the cow laid down 
pushed hard for a minute or two, and the front shoulders of the calf slipped out, followed quickly by the rest of the body. The cow didn't move for several long seconds, and the calf was still as well. Ashley wanted to run over, to make it breathe, make the cow get up, do something. But Tig stood, tense and still, watching. She tried to reassure herself that he would know if there was a problem and would be moving to fix it. Finally, after what felt like way too long, Ashley saw the wet ears move, then the head shook. The mama seemed to find her second wind and struggled to her feet, turning and starting to lick her new baby, who was awkwardly trying to lift its head. A head that wobbled and jerked as its mom focused on getting him clean. It's pretty cold out, but I think they're going to be just fine. He's got a dark coat with lots of hair, and the sun will warm him up as his mama cleans him off. Tig turned to smile at her, his look proud and happy. She probably had the exact same expression on her face and didn't stop to question it, although she had done nothing and wasn't sure why she'd be proud of anything. Maybe it was just like Tig said. There was something about birth that was just an awe-inspiring miracle. You ready? He brushed his hands down his pants and turned toward her. Yep, she said, thinking that if she and Tig ended up together, this would be her life. Cold, snow, blinding sun, everyday miracles, and a capable man who would stand beside her always. Chapter 18 My husband has this amazing talent. He makes me fall in love with him every day. That's what makes our marriage last. Plus, he makes me laugh. We're living happily ever laughter. Janet Jolly, Providence, Utah Tig listened absent-mindedly to Ellen as she rambled on about the dance and her friends and how excited she was to get to ride in a real horse-drawn sleigh. Normally, he loved listening to his niece. She felt like his daughter, although he tried to never lose sight of the fact that his brother and his wife were her real parents. He didn't want her growing up not knowing them. But tonight, he had a lot of other things on his mind. Ashley had left the afternoon that the calf had been born after he'd driven her over to Ford's in the tractor, and she'd talked to him and his wife, Morgan. The conversation had gone well. Really well, if he judged by Ashley's shining eyes and excited conversation on the way back over to his place. It was just to get her stuff, though, because the Hansons had offered her one of Rem and Elaine Martinez's vacation cabins to stay in. It wasn't terribly far away from their place, and it came with the employment package they'd offered. If Ashley seemed a little down as she packed up the few things she'd brought and said goodbye to him when Ford came over for her on his tractor, Tig chalked it up to his imagination. They pulled into Cord and Rosie Stryker's farm, and Ellen's excited chatter faded away. He looks just like a movie, she said softly, awe laced with the excitement in her voice. It's pretty, that's for sure. He couldn't disagree. Cord and Rosie had made a lot of improvements to their farm, financed by the sale of trained pairs of matched Percherons, along with the custom-made sleighs that had put their corner of North Dakota on the world map. Maybe it didn't look quite so bright to him because he'd hoped to come with Ashley, but... Just like so many years ago, she'd told him as she was leaving that maybe she'd see him there, but that she'd be throwing herself into her new job and would find her own way if she came. The lane was snow-covered, as was the parking lot, so it was a little surprising to see a Mercedes parked alongside the farm trucks and older cars that filled the area. He pulled his old pickup to a stop and turned the key, killing the motor. Some kind of not-good premonition floated up his backbone. This is going to be so much fun, Ellen exclaimed, 
no longer whispering as she unbuckled her belt and hopped out of the truck, slamming the door behind her. Somehow, any excitement he had had vanished somewhere along the driveway. Now, more than anything, he wished he hadn't come. It had been years since Ashley's parents had convinced her that he wasn't good enough for her, but all the feelings flooded back as he watched the sleigh come into sight, cord in the driver's seat, a couple cozied up in blankets behind him, Christmas music drifting out of the barn, and big, fluffy snowflakes falling in the softly glowing lights that illuminated the lot and area outside the barn, completing the movie-worthy picture. Years. But the feelings hit him like it was yesterday. Or this afternoon. Ellen, he said as he stepped out of the truck. Yeah, Uncle Tyke? Ellen skipped to a stop and turned, looking at him like she couldn't quite believe how slowly he was moving. I'm not feeling the greatest, and I think I might head back home. I'll call Flynn and make sure that he and Katie can drop you off on their way home, okay? Do you want me to go home with you? Ellen asked, chewing her lip. He supposed it wasn't a typical question from a teenager, but Ellen wasn't a typical preteen. It had been her and Tig all her life. He supposed that made her a little different. No, you've been looking forward to it, and I don't want you to miss anything. I'll be fine. She didn't look convinced, but nodded and turned, running toward the sleigh where she saw friends from school standing by the platform, waiting their turn to ride. Tig didn't want to leave without making sure she'd be supervised, even though she was a very responsible kid. He wasn't the best parent in the world, far from it, but he hoped he was good enough to help guide her in the right direction and protect her when she needed it. Hoped. You're wasting your time coming the whole way here, Dad. Tig paused as he pulled his phone out. That sounded like Ashley. He turned. You're making the biggest mistake of your life. The man's voice carried easily across the parking lot. Ty could see the trio of people outlined for a brief moment by the bright lights and smiling faces of the party going on inside the barn until the door closed behind them. The slender woman between the older couple started walking toward the parking lot, her eyes seeming to scan the vehicles as she pulled her phone out of her coat pocket. No. I think I made the biggest mistake of my life the last time you convinced me to leave an honorable man and do what you wanted me to. It was definitely Ashley. Her voice wasn't angry or strident, but it was firm, very firm. She held her phone up to her ear, just as Tiges buzzed in his hand. He smiled, not even paying attention to what her dad said as she kept walking, her parents following along behind. Hello. Hey, Tig. I'm sorry I kind of lost contact with you over the past few days. I can't wait to tell you what's been going on. Are you coming to Cord and Rosie's party? He smiled at her rush of words. She didn't know he was watching her, and it also made him grin that she didn't mention her parents, or that they were obviously trying to talk her into doing what they wanted once again. I'm here. Oh? She stopped short turning back and looking at the barn. Are you inside? No. She swung in a slow circle, still not seeing him over at the end of the lot in the darkest corner. Tig, where are you? He started to move slowly forward. I'm looking at the most beautiful woman in North Dakota right now. You're... Her voice trailed off as she processed what he said. He stepped out into the light and her eyes landed on him. Looking at you, yeah. She laughed, dropping her phone from her ear and striding over to him. She didn't stop, but threw her arms around him, hugging him tight. Whoa, you keep this up and I'm gonna think you missed me. I did. How is that possible? We spent, what, three days together? How is it possible that those three days made me feel like being with you is the only thing I'll ever want? He didn't have a chance to answer, 
because her parents made their way over. This isn't the same fellow, is it? Her mother's voice sounded shocked. Yes, it is, and I'm marrying him. She grimaced as she pulled back and looked up at him. If he'll have me. Ladies don't marry cowboys. Her mother's voice held snob. Then this cowboy's gonna marry the lady. It was a small distinction, but one he felt confirmed Ashley's words and added his agreement. Maybe it was the right thing, because she had been biting her lip, but her face broke out in a smile after his words. You're making a big mistake. Her father's voice broke into Tig's thoughts. I might be. Ashley didn't sound like she believed that at all. But if I am, then you have to let go and let me make it. She smiled at her parents and, as much as Tig didn't want to like them, they were his, hopefully, future wife's family. I'm going to do me best to make sure this is the best decision she ever makes. Just love me. That's all it will take to make it the best decision of my life. Sleigh bells rang in the distance and a horse whinnied. Music drifted across the cold and crisp night air and snowflakes fell softly to the ground. Tige looked deep into Ashley's eyes and maybe it was the sounds of the season or maybe it was the feeling of rightness in his chest that settled down deep, but he had the thought that tonight was the beginning of a beautiful life together. Her parents interrupted the magic that had settled around them, and Tig allowed Ashley to gently, but firmly, reiterate what she'd already said. They stomped off while he continued to hold her, warm and soft against his chest. I think they'll come around. If we give them another ten years? No, it won't take that long. You know them better than I do. They admitted that they knew my sister was lying, but they gave her the promotion anyway. I think they thought it would put me even more under their thumb, that they were scared that I was becoming too good at what I did. That's because you are good at what you do. Ford Hansen had certainly been impressed. She smiled, a little embarrassed, but obviously warmed by his words. I know they meant it to keep me tied to them, but it actually freed me. I'm so excited about what I'm going to be doing with Ford and Morgan's farm, and I'm even more excited because it means I'll be working with you. Her smile widened. I actually thanked them for what they did. I bet that left them speechless. You don't know my mother. She wasn't at a loss for words for more than about two seconds, which, I admit, is something of a record for her. You chose me. Huh? You chose me. This time, you chose me. Her face fell, and immediately he regretted his words, even though he'd meant them with the best of intentions. I should have chosen you the last time. I was thinking about that. Maybe we weren't meant for each other at that time, you know? We had ten years of growing before we were right for each other. Maybe. She didn't look convinced, and she didn't look happy. I'm saying it was meant to be. He lifted a hand and pushed a stray hair back away from her face. Not really because it needed it, but because he wanted to touch her. You're a different person today than you were back then. Better. You make me better. That made him smile, especially because he could see she meant it. As iron sharpeneth iron. Did you mean what you said about marrying me? Her lip pulled back and he hesitated. They'd only spent a few days together. Sure, they'd hung out almost every day for a year. But that was ten years ago. Maybe she felt it was too soon. Tempted to say what he thought she wanted to hear, rather than the truth, he spoke the words in his heart. Yes, I did. I want to marry you. I know that's crazy. Something a teenager would say after the few days we were together, rather than a decision a grown man would make. But it's the truth. 
I meant what I said as well. And I meant it because of what we were just talking about. Iron sharpening iron. Being married to, being with someone who makes me a better person. Isn't that the very best thing ever? All that, and I have trouble standing this close to you and trying not to wish you were kissing me. I guess I feel like there couldn't be anyone better for me. Did the lady say kissing? Marrying and kissing. Is the order important? That made her grin. Not tonight, but soon it will be. Soon, like tomorrow. Wow, you really are acting like a teenager. I warned you. You did. I didn't want to believe you, though. I hope I'm a little smarter, even if I'm just as impatient. You're definitely smarter and better looking. Better looking? He lowered his head, but stopped just before their lips touched. Are you trying to butter me up? Nope, just stating facts. And for someone who's impatient, you're sure taking your sweet time with this whole kissing thing. He smiled, answering her by shifting just a bit until their lips touched and his eyes closed and his heart raced and his hands tightened around her, never wanting to let her go. She pressed closer, her hand coming up and curling around his neck, and he forgot about the dance and the horses, her parents and the fact that he had nothing while she had everything, because none of that mattered. Nothing mattered, except together they would be far better than they were apart. They'd grow and change and inspire each other for the rest of their lives. They finally pulled apart enough for him to rest his forehead on hers. I think you owed me a dance ten years ago, and you've never paid up. So maybe we should go inside and I'll work on paying my debts. They smiled at each other, tender smiles of love and devotion. I love you, he whispered softly, thinking that he really didn't care if they ever walked into the barn. I love you too, she whispered back. Maybe... Before we go in, we could practice that kissing thing once more. I can't believe we spent a whole year together and never figured out how much fun that was. We have a lot of time to make up. We sure do. It was a long time before they made it into the barn. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.